welcome back to Emotions and Potions. A love slash hate letter to with your lovely hosts, Ashton and Alex. And this week, we are continuing the saga, the soul saga. Yes. We're doing revenge, right? It's time for her soulful revenge. By Harley LaRue. Book number two out of three. We did book number one last week. So if you haven't listened to that episode, you might want to do that just so you get the full full story. <laughs> yeah. Though we have decided that book one and two could be like switched out. They could. As far as reading orders. So they could. Start you don't, here, go yeah. back. But I mean, definitely listen to both. All right, Alex. Let me hear some of these trigger content warnings that Harley is so nice to include already. Yeah, I don't have to do a whole lot of work for this set of books because, like you said, Harley spells it out. She does. For us. So what, what types of things will we be seeing? So trigger content warnings. We have drug use, loss, death of family, scenes of trauma, anxiety, PTSD, mentions of suicide and domestic violence, depictions of hard kink and edge play, kinks and fetishes, knife play, gun play, body modifications, including piercing and scarification, degradation, vlogging, blood play, public play, voyeurism, bondage, primal play. That's it. Isn't that enough? <laughs> Just wanted to make sure you were done. <laughs> That's a lot going on. But the first one had about the same gist of things. Yeah. So it's going to be pretty on brand. So you've been warned. And then um, additional warning, we're going to be spoiling the fuck out of this book. Yep. There will be no spoilers left to be spoiled by the end of this episode. <laughs> so wrong. you've been warned. And I'm just going to jump right into the synopsis. Juniper. After a cult tried to sacrifice me to their wicked god, I went on the run, doing whatever was necessary to survive, until a demon offered me a deal. Give him my soul, and he'll help me claim the vengeance I seek. Blood will be spilled, and the monsters I once ran from will soon be running from me. But damning my soul was just the beginning. It's my heart the demon wants next. Zane. I've been hunting souls for centuries, but she's the ultimate prize. Vicious and feral, with a broken soul as dark as my own. I thought claiming her would be a simple game, but Juniper is far from simple. I chose to follow her on a path drenched with blood of her enemies, but it's our blood that may be spilled next. As an ancient god wakes from its slumber, neither of us may survive. Her Soul for Revenge is book two in the Souls trilogy. Although all books are interconnected, they are standalone and can be read in any order. So that is the synopsis. It's a really good one. I mean, the first book also had a great synopsis. Yeah, I think that the synopsis for these books are very strong. Mm -hmm. It gives like, it tells you enough without really giving away much. But you know you're going to get into a dark read. Yeah, and you kind of, you know, like souls, like you're selling a soul. Like it's going to be more of a monster, paranormal read. Yep, but it also lets you know there's going to be some romance in there too. Which we love. We love to see some good old romance between humans and demons. What's not to love? <laughs> I didn't think I'd be into that until um, Harley LaRue. Harley, you converted us. <laughs> or ruined us, maybe. I don't know. Maybe a little bit of both. <laughs> okay, Alex, now that we got trigger content warnings, we have the synopsis. So what is the potion that is going along with this episode? Keeping with, you know, the dark romance. The potion for this episode is a bloody, dark, and stormy. Oh, wow. W what? Where? Why? How? Huh? <laughs> you need to break this one down for me, girl. What the hell is this? <laughs> so it's a take on a dark and stormy. I don't know what that is. A dark and stormy is um, Gosling's Black Bermuda Rum and Ginger Beer. Oh, just those two things? Just those two things. It sounds very complicated. Sounds more complicated than what it is. Okay. Of course, I'm making you're it. You're making it a little bit more complicated because you're Alex and tis what you do. Mm -hmm. So how did you how did you make this your own? So the bloody part Okay. is uh, some blood orange. You are a fan of blood orange. Okay. I like that. I mean, it's in, it's in my liquor collection. Gotta use it. So what, are you using rum still? Yep. Still going to do the traditional ingredients with a dark and stormy. The Gosling's Black Bermuda Rum and the Gosling's Ginger Beer. Then going to add some blood orange liqueur, some pineapple juice, Ooh. and some grenadine at the bottom to, again, make it look bloody. bloody. 
Ooh, that sounds good. I I like the additions. I don't think I would like a normal classic. What is it called? Dark and Stormy. Dark and Stormy. I don't think I would like that. I didn't think you would like it either, which is why I was trying to like figure out ways to kind of make it more Ashton. Well, I definitely appreciate like fruit being added to the drink. I love grenadine. Anything that's going to sweeten it up. I'm a fan of blood orange too. You've made me a drink with blood orange before. I really liked it. So I'm feeling pretty positive about about this drink. So I think we should try it now because I have not tried it yet. Okay, Alex, this has a lot going on. I'm kind of here for it, though. I like this. I think I think I could drink this throughout the course of this episode and finish it. I'm glad. Well done. Thank you. You've done it again. And like always, the recipe will be on our Instagram in the course description of this episode and on our TikTok, Emotions and Potions Pod. If you type that in anywhere, you'll find us. All right, we got the booze. We got our potions. Let's get into our emotions. Yes, so let's break down this book. Start to finish, here come the spoilers. So you've been warned. Everybody hold on to your butts. All right, so the book starts off with Juniper's backstory, and we find out that her grandfather taught her, if the woods call your name, don't answer, run. And her father taught her, Ain't a thing in these woods you can't kill. Juniper is 15 and in high school, Victoria, from book one, Victoria Hadley, has brought acid for her and Juniper so they can trip in the woods. Turn up. Let's get it. 15-year-olds tripping on some acid in the freaking haunted woods? Yeah. You know where I would be. Not there. (laughs) Yeah, no. No, thank you. I will totally pass on that. Juniper is content to be amongst nature during their trip, but Victoria wants to go into St. Thaddeus Church. Victoria drags a tripping juniper to the abandoned church and is greeted by Kent Hadley and the Libri cult members. And it's time for the Kynes sacrificial offering, which is juniper. She is a descendant of the Kynes survivor. And Kent starts to carve runes into her chest and then shoves her in the mine. See ya. Have fun. Three years later, Zane is taking care of Leon, who has recently been severely punished and tortured by Kent, who ordered Leon to find Juniper, who was recently released from a mental institution for trying to kill Victoria. And he refused, so he had to suffer some very harsh consequences. Juniper was able to escape Kent's cult and Leon hunting her the night of the sacrifice. Zane has always been intrigued by Juniper, who was able to escape not only Kent's cult, but Leon hunting her the night the sacrifice went awry. And Zane is a soul hunter who prefers odd damaged and beaten souls. And Juniper is right up his alley. Oh yeah, like moth to a freaking flame. Right? Later that evening, Zane is in a local diner along with three other soul hunters and in walks Juniper, ready to rob the place for some food. She makes a getaway before the cops can get there, But unbeknownst to her, she has the attention of all the soul hunters in the building. Zane, being a legend in the field, calls a dibs on Juniper and gets the other hunters to back off. And he begins to track and hunt her. As Juniper is trying to get out of Ablem, Zane catches up with her. And there's also Eld Beast after her. Of course there are. It's always going to be something hunting after our sacrifices. Juniper spots the beast and Zane, and he winds up giving her a little lesson in how to kill them. Then he wishes her well in surviving the next few years and promises her that she will see him again. And the next time she does, he's going to have an offer for her. I wonder what it could be. Hmm. So mysterious, Zane. A demon with an offer. (laughs) Also during this entire exchange, Juniper threatens Zane throughout, which he takes as flirting, which makes him even more intrigued. And wants her even more. Yeah, because Juniper is a, like, no bullshit kind of gal. Like, she's rough around the edges. She's I mean, been she's been through some shit. shit. Yeah, but that is, like, that is freaking Zane's kink. Yeah, it's like catnip for him. Yeah, he loves a fighter. He loves someone that's, like, damaged and that is just freaking raising hell. He's and like, so, ooh, threatening me? That's threatening me with a good time. Yeah, like, you're threatening me? Now I have a boner. Thanks. <laughs> Do something about it. <laughs> We get a time jump, and Juniper has been on her own, becoming more of a badass, taking out Eld Beast across the United States as she tries to survive and stay the hell away from Ablem. We learn that the Eld take form of, like, they get creature-like bodies of the animals in the area. 
So like when she's in Louisiana, they would appear as like weird gators. Terrifying. All of these things are terrifying. Yeah. And they don't ever stop. Nope. They just shift to match the terrain. The surrounding area, yeah. And Juniper is currently in a dive bar on the outskirts of a small town, and she's being a pool shark and winning some money. One of the local bar patrons doesn't take too kindly to being swindled and gets aggressive with Juniper, and she winds up killing him. And a shootout in the bar begins. Casual. Very under the radar, Juniper. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And who else happens to be there but our good old friend Zane? After the bar massacre, Zane asks Juniper, Zuniper. Zuniper. That's, I think, their, um, their couple name. I like it. <laughs> Mistake that turned into something? <laughs> Zane asks Juniper if she's good, and she gets a hint of recognition, but doesn't stay too long to dwell on it as she hears sirens approaching, and she needs to get the hell away from this bar shootout. I mean, this murder scene. Mass murder. Mass murder that she committed. <laughs> With the help of Zane. And she takes off in her Jeep. As she's driving out of Dodge, an Eld shows up running her off of the road. And she gets out of her car to kill it. And Zane once again is there and witnesses her kill the Eld. And is like, you can hold your own. How cute. They go into like this back and forth verbal sparring match yet again, which gets them both aroused. Ending with Juniper calling Zane out for not making a move on her. And it is now game on for Zane. Yeah, she's pretty much just given him the freaking green light. Mm -hmm. He's ready to go. So he calls her out for wanting to be taken advantage of by a stranger in the woods and begins to finger bang her. He then tells her he's going to wreck her pussy and she tries to call his bluff. So Zane starts to punish her with his dick. Juniper can feel that he is abnormally large. She hasn't learned that he's a demon just yet, but he did try to hint at it earlier in their spat when he told her that he was from hell. Yeah, I mean, like, he, there is this point where he straight up is like, oh, yeah, I'm, like, from hell or whatever. And, and she's, she's just like, like, oh, sure. Okay, yeah, me too. <laughs> she's like, well, I live in hell, so I know. <laughs> whatever. Been there, done that. Yeah. <laughs> their outdoor sex capade gets very primal, with Zane biting her shoulder, drawing blood, growling, a lot of rough fucking. And, like, that's also Juniper's Emma. Like, she enjoys a rougher bang session as well yeah because it's like she wants to kind of have control over being in pain because pain was inflicted on her from being a sacrifice by the cult without her knowledge so it's like she's got a little bit of yeah got a little bit of ptsd so far her and zane are matching up pretty good though yeah she likes to take pain and make it a pleasurable experience yeah and zane likes dishing and receiving pain so match made in a hell (laughs) During the height of their arousal, Juniper looks up at Zane and his demon form is on display, which makes her come. Interesting. Very interesting. After they finish, Zane does reveal to Juniper he is a demon. Surprise? (laughs) (laughs) Not surprise. And Juniper finally recognizes him from before and realizes he's been following her for the last three years. Zane lets her know that he wants her and when she is sick of running to come and find him. Until then, stay alive because he wants to play with her again. And he leaves her his phone number on her dashboard. He is playing the long game and he doesn't mind. He's like, she'll come. He quite enjoys it. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's, He's confident in his skills of soul hunting. He never once doubts himself in this book as far as like, as long as it like relates to Juniper. Yeah. He may doubt some other things. Yeah. And we might, we might doubt him. And his intentions, but he never doubts himself. Nope. We get a flashback dream of Juniper in the mental hospital with her younger brother, Marcus, who came to visit her, which winds up morphing into him telling her that it's too late and then like a tentacle monster starts to consume him. I hated this part of the book. It and was kind of like what it leads into. Mm-hmm. And then Juniper wakes up from this dream to a text message from her mother stating that Marcus is dead and his funeral's on Saturday. I hate this, even though from reading the first book, you know Marcus was the first sacrifice and you know he's Juniper's brother. But like reading about kind of like how Juniper and his relationship fell apart because everyone thought she was lying. Mm -hmm. Like she was forced out of the town. She was held in in like an institution for three years because people were like, this bitch crazy. Because they thought like the acid trip kind of 
fried her tri- brain. Right, triggered something and fucked up her head. And then, like, when she's out, no one is fucking with her. And she is, like, all alone. Her family kind of abandons her. Abandon her and no one really believes her. And now her brother is dead. Like, it's so, it's sad. It it's is. really heartbreaking. And, like, her mom's kind of cut her off. So, like, in this text message, when she tells Juniper that the funeral's Sunday, she's like, if you show up, like, don't cause a scene. Freaking rude. Freaking rude. And she's like, I don't even know if this is your phone number anymore, but, like, your brother's dead. Yeah, I thought you would like to know. So it's time for Juniper to head back to Ablem. Juniper is in attendance of her brother's funeral, but she's, like, in the shadows not wanting to be noticed because she really doesn't give a fuck about any of these people. Yeah, and I don't think that she wants people to know she's back in town. No. Like, she's trying to stay under, you know, under the radar. Yeah, and she wants to wait to say her personal goodbye with him, like, after everyone's left and kind of even, like, after groundskeepers and stuff have gone home. So she doesn't emerge until after midnight, and that's when Leon shows up and digs up Marcus's body to bring to Kent. If you remember book one, Leon was ordered Mm -hmm. to go and retrieve Marcus's body. And now we learn that Juniper was there and witnessed the whole thing. And she recognizes Leon from her botched sacrifice because he was sent to like go find her. And chase her and take her back to the mine. So she is pissed at Leon once again, rightfully so, but also doesn't want him to see her. Can't blame her. Can't blame her at all. And Juniper knows the Hadleys are behind Marcus's murder since she knows that Leon is one of Kent's minions. So she's ready to take down the Hadleys and the Libri no matter what deal has to be made. So Zane meets up with Juniper at a bar outside of town to make a deal for her soul, her body, and sexual submission. Mmm, kinky. Because Juniper sent him a text and was like, I'm ready to talk. What you doing? (laughs) W-Y-D. You up? You up? Let's meet. (laughs) (laughs) Due to Juniper being drunk, he wants her to think on the offer, and if she accepts, to find him in the forest the next night. And doesn't she, like, kind of ask why? And he's like, so no one will hear you scream. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> such a demon, like, vibe right here. <laughs> His and Juniper's banter is so funny. So, like, yeah. And that's one thing that I really, like, I think about just Harley. I think her writing is because I really enjoyed Ray and Raylan and Leon. Leon's banter. But... Juniper and Zane have the similar themes of like conversation, but like she brings a whole different, like whole different characters to this kind of banter, mm-hmm. even though it's very similar, but like it just fits them so well, like the characters. And it's so humorous as well, especially since you're dealing with such dark themes throughout this book to have moments where you're just laughing at just the absurdity of how they talk to each other. Yeah, because Zane is very... He doesn't give a fuck. Like, he is just saying whatever, and it's it's comical. Like, as yeah. much as Zane is kind of a badass, because he is this badass demon, like, he's kind of funny. He's so funny. And I don't think it's, like, it's meant to be funny, but it just is because of that, like, zero fucks attitude. And then Juniper is the same way. So, like, when they just go at each other, it's just, like, this is ridiculous. But they're also, like, turning each other on at the same time. Like... <laughs> It just adds to the absurdity of everything, and you just have to laugh. Yeah. And also get slightly turned on. We don't don't talk about it. It's a strange (laughs) dynamic. Am I Juniper? No. (laughs) Then we get a flashback to Juniper crawling her way out of the mine just to be hunted again by Leon. And Juniper decides she's going into the forest to make a deal with Zane, which leads to a primal chasing consensual non-consent sex scene. Yeah, because he pretty much, he can tell that she wants it, but she's fighting herself because, like, why wouldn't you kind of fight yourself? And she's also getting, like, memories and flashbacks to being in the forest again. Right. Being haunted by a demon. Right. Zane's a demon. Leon's a demon. That type of thing. A lot of PTSD going on. Yep. And so Zane is actually the one that is like, do you want me to take it, wink, wink, from you? Like, will that help you if you fight me? But ultimately given and she's kind of like actually yeah Yeah. I think that will help that'll help and so that is what they do and we get another outdoor wooded in many ways sex scene wooded (laughs) it took me a minute there you like said it and I was kind of like what and I was no I get you good one 
After a very thorough and rough outdoor fuck and soul mm-hmm. offering, Zane takes an exhausted to the point of unconscious Juniper back to his house to get cleaned up and rest. So in this scene, not only is it like a full on sex scene, but it's also her giving her soul to him, right? Yeah. So she has to carve his name into her body, which was like another kind of PTSD moment for them to work through to like reclaim power over what Kent did to her. Right. Because Juniper obviously was a failed sacrifice. So she has a bunch of scarring all over her chest with Mm -hmm. the runes and the stuff, which she's gotten tattoos to kind of cover some of it, try to... Blend into it. But she still has issues with the scars. Right. Oh, for sure. And she still has issues with being cut, I'm sure. But Zayn, like, takes control and he ends up writing or carving his name in between, like, her tits, like, on her chest. Mm Mm-hmm. And I think she actually has, like, a wolf tattoo right there. Yeah, and, like, the way he does it, it, like, fits seamlessly with the tattoo that she has. So it's aesthetically pleasing. It's Mm -hmm. not these botched up scars because Ken obviously didn't give a fuck. He was just carving her. And again, Juniper also had, like, control of the situation and consent into it. They just did it in a way... That she was able to cope with it. Mm-hmm. So this was very intense. It was a very intense scene. A lot going on. Also all while being fucked. Yeah. Okay. A lot happening. And something I do really appreciate about Zane, which like is throughout this whole book, but like you really start, it really starts to get to solidified here, is he can read Juniper. Like when she starts to kind of go into like a panic attack. Or, or a spiral. A spiral starts doubting herself for the situation he can can tell and like steer her to kind of navigate it better and like take control and conquer her fears. And that's one thing that about Zane that makes him a person that you want to root for in Mm -hmm. a book because technically demons, like, you know, in our mythology, demons are bad. You know, you don't make a deal with a freaking demon. You don't sell your soul to the demon. Like that is common knowledge and like, you know, whatever. But Zane towards Juniper, he is the sweetest, most like caring and it grows yeah. obviously it grows he has an obsession with her at the beginning but as this book goes you can see the change and like he, he actually tries her. to help her through her all shit. of her tra- her trauma he tries to like get her by but i also think that that is just because he wants her to the only thing he wants her to be afraid of is him at first it comes across as kind of selfish but then it really does morph into like him truly caring about her and wanting her to overcome her fears and you know, other hangups and stuff. Yeah, but it makes him a pretty good romance lead Mm -hmm. because he is very understanding of Juniper, knows what she needs, when she needs it, knows her better than she sometimes, I think, knows herself. Oh, yeah. And so Zane is exactly the type of thing (laughs) that Juniper- entity. (laughs) Yeah, whatever you want to call it. He's exactly what Juniper needs. And it, it that grows, and you see that throughout the whole book, and I mm-hmm. love that. Love so good. it. Okay, so Juniper has woken up in Zane's bed, confused and baffled, to find herself clean and tucked into bed. Juniper is looking at her new scars and realizes she doesn't have that fear of disgust that she associates with the scars that Kent gave her. Juniper is now exploring Zane's house with a sheet wrapped around her when she ends up stabbing Zane in the living room because he sneaks up on her, And, of course, she grabbed a knife. I mean, you wake up in a new surrounding uh, and being Juniper and what she's gone through, that tracks. Zane then tells her that threats and pain turn him on. So to him, she's flirting with him. Oh, that's foreplay, baby. And he likes being stabbed by her. Okay. Zane then tells Juniper that hell has a council that is like their government. So he's kind of explaining the rules and the hierarchy of hell. So he also mentions that they have rules that they have to follow as demons, like not making deals and then killing the people so the demon doesn't have to complete their side of the bargain. As much as hell seems like a bad place, like they have order. Yeah. And they like have shit that you can and can't do. Like, okay, spell it out for me, daddy-o. He tells Juniper that hell looks down on that. So he is going to do everything in his power to keep her alive, including bathing, feeding, and washing her clothes. Take care of me. And that's another the great thing about Zane. Like, he literally does take care of Juniper. Okay, so far, right, we have patient. Mm-hmm. We have confident. He's very confident in his abilities to make Juniper his. Understanding. He's understanding. He's comforting. He's caring. He kind of provides therapy. He does chores for her and makes sure that she's okay. Um, 
sounded like a pretty good man to me. Winner, winner. Winner, winner, chicken freaking dinner. Or have my soul for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Juniper and Zane leave the house to get food, and Juniper starts questioning Zane about what he does. He owns a house and a car, and Juniper's curious. Zane tells Juniper that he's a soul hunter and is compensated well for his work. Because he's constantly getting souls into hell, so why wouldn't he be? Zane takes Juniper to get food while he is still shirtless, and she's wrapped in a towel. They just go into town looking like that. Okay. That's going to, you know, that's not going to draw any attention. No. Zane then asks Juniper what her first plan of attack is, and she tells him about Marcus's body being dug up, and she wants to know where he is. Zane tells her he knows the demon who dug Marcus up, so he will get that information for them. Juniper tells Zane to kill the demon since she doesn't want Kent to have protection, and Z tells her no. He says, I will not be doing that. Juniper tells Zane how Leon was the one who chased her for hours the night of her sacrifice, her failed sacrifice, and how he would have thrown her back in the mine. Zane proceeds to tell Juniper how Leon is a prisoner of his own and hates the Hadleys just as much as she does, and she will not be killing him either. He kind of puts his foot down. He's like, I get your grudge. But, but he's you my bro. The, and you don't know the whole story here. <laughs> he's my bestie. You're not killing my bestie. He also tells her that they are bonded by showing Juniper his double pierced tongue. So at least one of those piercing belong to Leon. Juniper does not like any of this and feels like Zane has already betray- betrayed their bargain. Zane tells her that's not the truth and promises to get the info on Marcus's body. Zane finds Leon on campus outside the building with caution tape. Leon is on guard duty since this is the building in which Marcus was killed. So another instance of, you know, book one, yep. Leon's guard duty. Zane is teasing and annoying Leon. So he leaves, but tells Leon to meet him at the local pub downtown since Kent already wants Leon down there to keep an eye on things. Another setup to a scene from book one. They meet later that evening when Zane realizes Leon has a new possible obsession that he can't stop looking at. Ray. Ray. (laughs) He tells Leon that anyone associated with the Hadleys is bad news. Leon then tells Zane about the first sacrifice, Marcus, and how he was ordered to throw the body down the mine. Zane knows Juniper is going to love that. Sarcasm. Zane teases Leon about how many times he has tried to kill Zane, and then they make their exit heading outside to smoke a joint. So they're both sucker for pain. Yep. And they were just teasing about that. Because they're also ex-lovers, remember? Yep. As they are outside, they notice Ray and invite her over. So this is kind of a scene from book one that we get in Zane's point of view now. Which I loved this. I do I do enjoy this the sections of this book that overlap mm-hmm. with the first book, especially when there is character interaction. I love when we see characters from book one or book two or whatever it is. And it starts to fill those plot yes. holes and the things I hated about book one. Exactly. So Leon starts to play with Ray as Zane stands by and keeps watch. So if you remember this scene. During this, you know, Leon is fingering Ray in the alley. But Zane is thinking about Juniper and how he is going to make her scream. So he's already kind of obsessed with her. And he's already kind of like monogamous towards her. Yeah, because he's kind of like, nah, I'll take a step back. Like, you guys have fun. I'll keep a lookout. And normally he would be like all All in it. Because him and Leon have also shared yeah. in the past. Yeah. But I think Zane also picks up on the fact that Leon probably don't really want to share Ray either. Yeah. So after Leon makes Ray come, Leon licks one finger, lets Z lick the other. We know this scene. They say their goodbyes to Ray and start walking down Main Street where Zane calls Leon out on his new obsession again. Leon denies it and then they both get a whiff of the Eld Beasts. So Leon makes his way into the forest because he needs to let loose a little steam. That interaction with Ray didn't do it for him. It wasn't enough. No. So Zane returns home a little after midnight to a dark home in which he is disappointed that his little wolf is sleeping because he wanted to play with her. It's her. Hmm. He also notices cinnamon and sage burning outside the locked door. So once he gets in, he can smell her fear and Juniper is in the kitchen with a gun aimed at his head. She explains she started to hear the cry of the monsters once the sun set, so she has been on the lookout ever since. Zane tells Juniper where Marcus is buried through some, like, back-and-forth banter. Like, 
always when Juniper and Zane are conversing, their banter is A1. Like, I wish we could go into more detail because their banter is just amazing. But this plot, this episode would literally be eight hours long because we'd be reading you the book. Yeah, <laughs> this I I highlighted so many passages of like just their conversations. And I normally don't do that. Or if I do, it's probably like at Here max there. like five. Right. I have so many things highlighted for this book because I just loved the way they spoke to each other. Me too. I love it. Through this kind of back and forth banter, Juniper ends up getting annoyed with Zane and tries to stab him again, but he stops her before she's able to. Zane is now pressed up on Juniper and he has a lot of pent up sexual energy. So he tells Juniper to tell him no if she doesn't want it and then starts kissing down her neck. He tells Juniper not to stab him when he removes his hand from her wrist or he will punish her. As soon as he releases her, Juniper tries to strike him, (laughs) but Zane obviously stops her and she loses her balance, falling on the floor where Zane instantly is on top of her and she's on her stomach. He asks for the word that will make the game stop and she says mercy. So remember, demons have safe words. It's funny that Zane and Juniper's safe word is the same as Leon and Ray's safe word. I wonder if that's just like the demon safe word in general. Like the go-to. Like mercy instead of red. Zane gets Juniper on her feet, then bends her over the kitchen counter. He takes the gun that she had and empties the magazine and any other bullets in the chamber. So he taunts her about his and her taste being similar as he's running the gun down her side. Zane continues to taunt Juniper and tells her he won't give her what she needs until she begs. And she tells him she doesn't beg. Zane moves the gun between her legs and adds some pressure. Juniper is now arching in to Zane, but is still fighting, verbally fighting. But her body is like, I'm here, I'm here for, for it. all of this. He then takes Juniper's pants off and is rubbing the gun against her clit and tells her to say, please. Zane then takes Juniper down to the ground so her face is against the tile and her ass is in the air. He pulls her pants down lower and puts the gun back on her clit. Zane is hoping Juniper will beg so he can get what he wants as well. But Juniper has other plans. She moans his name and tells him he won't be able to resist much longer. Where Zane replies, that's a dangerous game you're playing. She spreads her legs farther apart, trying to get him to break before she does. And this is just like the epitome of them. Is that like pull, like that fight, like the push and pull. pull. Yes. So she presses against the tip of the gun and starts to fuck herself on it while smiling and taunting Zane by saying how he wished it was his dick and and not a gun. And that she can get off on whatever. It doesn't matter to her. I love how they're just constantly challenging each other. For sure. And it doesn't stop. And like one-upping the other one. Zane doesn't take this lightly and threatens Juniper that nothing will stop him from making her weep and beg for him. Juniper is very turned on by Zane's threats and keeps taunting him and even moans out, oh God, and that she's going to come when he flips her on her over to her back and tells her never to yell out God's name. Only Only his name is allowed. He rips her panties off and starts taking off his pants as Juniper is lying there giggling as he places her legs by her shoulders. She tells him she knew he couldn't resist as he fucks her hard and fast. They both come and Juniper once again is taunting Zane that he gave in before she did. She won this round. She did. I mean, they both kind of do. But I'm going to give the point to Juniper. Yeah. Zane realizes he's addicted to her and that's bad news. Juniper informs Zane that they will be going to get Marcus's body tomorrow night. He then tells Juniper that she might think she won, but he is now more set out than ever to break her. Mm. I really enjoyed that sex scene. I thought that it was like, it was funny because Juniper was really egging him on and yeah. She knew what she was doing. She wasn't fucking. She's like, I don't beg, but I'll make you lose control before I do. And that's exactly what she did. Yeah. Good for you, Juniper. And it's funny because like, so this was a reread for us. The first time reading this sex scene through was probably what? The second time I'd ever read a book that had gunplay. And it was a little much. This time around, I was like, I'm here for this. <laughs> I don't know what has happened to me. <laughs> gunplay doesn't really do it for me but like everything else in this scene did so like i'm like i'm not mad at it i'm kind of i'm just like okay still never want that done to me no but like it didn't shock me and didn't make me feel 
as uncomfortable this second read through as it did my first read. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Desensitized to. <laughs> I don't know. Again, it's also kind of easier to like be okay with it with like this whole paranormal aspect. I don't know why that makes right. it slightly better. Because if you think about it, all books are not real. Or in romance fiction books, they're not real. They're meant to be made up. But when the content is also even more made up, it does make it easier mm -hmm. than like if it's set in real world. And it's kind of like, what in the... Or who like does everyone's this? actual humans and... Right, like mm -hmm. who does this? Like am I just weird <laughs> that I'm not doing this? But then I'm like, no, it's, it's, no, it's, it's fine. fine. It's, it's fine. fine. <laughs> so it's the next day. Juniper and Zane are getting ready to set out to White Pines to retrieve Marcus's body. Zane is picking up that Juniper is nervous and anxious and maybe even a little scared. She brushes him off and gets out of the car when she hears her name being whispered. And she realizes it's the God calling for her. No, thank you. No, um, thanks. Can we block that number? Yeah. Can we do not call? Do not like, yeah. New brainwave who this? Oof. They make the trek to the mine and each step is harder for Juniper to take. So poor Juniper, like during this portion of the book, like she is struggling. I mean, she struggles internally through a lot of this book. Mm -hmm. But girl, I felt for her. Same. In like multiple sections too. Because like as soon as she starts to conquer one thing. It's like the next thing that's knocking out her door. Yep. She does appreciate Zane being there with her. And all she wants to do is jump into his arms. Because she does. She already is starting to feel safe with him. As they're walking, Juniper notices a bunch of trinkets. Those tri the twigs and fish eyeball little like thingies scattered all throughout the trees leading towards the mine. They reach the mine and Zane rips off the boards to the mine and it smells awful. It's like one of the things that they really, Harley really puts in visuals when it comes to the smell of things. Because mm -hmm. it smells like death. <laughs> Which is not a good smell. No. Juniper sets up a rope to climb down and her and Zane enter the mine shaft. Zane leads the way since he can smell Marcus, so he kind of knows where they're going. He warns Juniper that they are close and she finally finds his body, but something else has found him first. So Juniper notices other creatures still in the cavern with them. They were as still as stone and were swaying ever so slightly that she almost missed that these were like things. That visual is so fucking creepy. I hate this chapter because it's terrifying. I don't like scary things. I think that I can read scary things more so than watch them. But even I was like, no, this is creepy. Like, I'm just getting like really creeped out. It was so, definitely really creepy. Uh, Zane indicates to stay quiet as he approaches Marcus's body and Juniper takes aim at the closest monster to Zane. Juniper starts to hear the god speaking to her and feels slash sees these tentacle-like things starting to wrap around her legs. She screams and jerks back and starts just shooting at these tentacles. Zane manages to get her out of her panic and Juniper realizes that there are no tentacles, but the monsters have now been awoken. They speak, asking who is there. Juniper makes a slight movement, raising her gun up, and it's enough to get the monster's attention. Zane and Juniper start running back, but Juniper trips and falls, a monster looming right over her as she shoots it. She's struggling to reload her gun when Zane leaps out and starts to attack the monsters with his, like, full demon abilities. The monsters then flee after Zane takes down two of them. He then carries Juniper out of the mine and she notices he's pretty badly injured, bitten, scratched, has broken fingers. Like Not they good. definitely got some, you know, hits in as well. He tells Juniper that those are golems. So remember the golems from book one. And they are- This is how they were awoken. Yes. And they are part of the god. These were the creepy figures that like stopped Ray in the middle of the road when she was in her car. It makes me wonder like if this didn't happen, would the golems have gone after Ray? I don't think so. I think the reasons the golems went after Ray is because Juniper accidentally woke them up. And then it was only a matter of time before they left the cave to venture out because they're hungry. Yeah. So yeah, I definitely think that this was a cause and effect. So Zane asks if the god spoke to her at all, and she admits that she heard voices and saw it. Zane is not thrilled to hear that, and he starts to drive out of the forest. Juniper wants to lean her head against his shoulder for the comfort and wants to thank him for saving her, even though he didn't have to. 
but she stays silent. She doesn't. Zane and Juniper drive back to her cabin where she plans on burying Marcus. She asks Zane to leave her because she just wants to be alone. She feels bad that she doesn't say thank you or anything nice, but she's also like, I'm not going to. <laughs> she also kind of doesn't need to because Zane already knows. Yeah. As she's digging Marcus's grave, she is walking down memory lane wishing things were different. She then buries Marcus and heads back inside the rundown cabin where she falls asleep and has a dream slash memory about her and Marcus as kids of them playing in the backyard. And this was so sweet and so sad. So Marcus was the prince and Juniper was his knight and she always she vowed to always protect him and like this was a game that they would play and they would fight fake dragons and but you know Juniper was always there keeping Marcus safe. And it's like it's heartbreaking. It's so heartbreaking. But the dream shifts and at the end waking her up. When Juniper wakes up, she hears growling and sees a hell a lot of eld beasts out back and she realizes they're fighting over Marcus. They have dug him up and, and eating, him. eating him. She doesn't think. She just runs out with a gun and starts firing since they want to take her brother away from her again. She is heavily outnumbered. She realizes this as she's on the ground with the monsters over her. Realize she's fucked up. Big time fuck up. So Zane's unable to truly leave Juniper. So he's been sitting in his car down like the driveway. It kind of like Juniper's cabin is kind of hidden in the woods. And he's just been chilling because he couldn't find it in himself to actually leave. And he's Which kind is of really pissed cute. that he has to like kind of be out of the way. He's like, I just wish you'd just let me take care of this for her. Right. She's like, he's like, why am I not being of more assistance? And he's also frustrated with himself because he can't seem to leave her alone. So it's like he's frustrated because he's like, I just want to help her, but also frustrated because he's like, she doesn't want my help, but I can't leave. <laughs> and also like, fuck, why do I want to help her? <laughs> yes. A lot of emotions. He wants her staying with him solely for the fact that they could plan better. And the cabin is no shape to house anyone. Okay. Mm -hmm. that, that's all. That's all. No other reasons? Yeah. So he gets out of his car to check on Juniper to see if she wants to go back with him when he hears growling and screaming in the distance. And it's her screaming. He sprints his way back to the cabin where he sees all the eld beasts surrounding Juniper and he freaking loses it. He attacks them with his bare hands and with this energy trick where he like gets all this energy and then he pushes it out and it like is a burst of energy and it bursts their heads open. So that's kind of cool. Cool trick, Zane. Don't fuck with Zane or he, Zane's woman, especially yeah, she, Zane's oof. woman. Jeez. He finally takes out all of the monsters and goes back to Juniper where he notices she is in bad shape. Her legs, arms, and back have been bitten and scratched all over. Juniper wakes up asking about Marcus and Zane is pissed and asks why she took on that many, that many elves. And she says that she couldn't not. They were eating her brother. She had to stop them. Zane promises he won't take her to the hospital, but stops at a pharmacy before heading home. That was a funny interaction. That was. He walks into this pharmacy and he is like... All bloody from this battle with like... Covered in eld beast blood. And the pharmacist's like, nice night? <laughs> He's like, don't worry about it. <laughs> Just here. Don't ask questions. <laughs> don't ask questions. I think the pharmacist guy was like, yeah, I don't want to know. So Juniper is in and out of it on um, the drive home. She's very hurt from the attack. As Zane is carrying her in, she asks why he came back for her. And he gives a very possessive monologue, essentially saying he never wants to hear her in that kind of pain again. And that he killed every single eld beast and he will kill anything that ever causes her pain ever. I'm kind of here for that sentiment, though. Me too. And so is Juniper, because she's kind of floored by this admission, but keeps quiet as he continues to patch her up. I would be like, oh, hot damn. Okay. This is my jam. Right? <laughs> like, Instantly <laughs> naked. Thank you. I Take know I almost died, but okay, let's go. Um, what does that say about us? I know, right? Juniper fights Zane all the way when he's patching her up because that's just her for you. He gets her to take some medicine and she finally lets him do his thing. Like she really was putting up a fight. Juniper says thank you finally to Zane and he tells her to take care of what is his and she isn't alone anymore. So she needs to get used to the help. Tough love. Yep. Yep. That's what she needs, though. Heck yeah. Zane carries Juniper to the shower where he undresses her and cleans her hair and body. Juniper then passes out from exhaustion, her injuries, and the meds she took. And Zane just tucks her into bed. 
Very nice. So Juniper and Zane head back to the cabin the next day as Zane reburies Marcus's body and then gives Juniper a moment to be alone and say goodbye. And like Juniper was like wanting to help him and he's like, no, sit the fuck down. Yeah. He's like, I am a demon. I can do this in five seconds. Sit your little human scrawny ass down. Who is like very hurt still. Still. And also still doped up on like oxy. And also on the brink of exhaustion. And on the brink of like spiraling. Just chill, girl. Sit down. You got someone who's actually going to help up. you. Let him do it. She's sitting there and she hears God calling her name. And she tells it that when it finds her, she will be drenched in the blood of its servants. She's had enough of this God and so have I. She heads back to the cabin to collect a few things. She then sleeps on and off for days, her body trying to recover. By day three, Juniper is out running and exercising because she can't sit still. She can't do nothing. Zane obviously has a problem with this and lets her know. She then asks why he cares, and his response is, stop asking that question because neither one of us is ready for the answer. Uh Uh-oh. That shut her up. Someone's in trouble in the Department of Love. Yeah, they both feel in it, but they're not ready to admit it yet. Juniper then tells Zane the story of what happened the night of her failed sacrifice. She had managed to climb up the walls to the door and was yelling, trying to get out, when she saw a figure in a cloak coming towards her. It turns out to be Heidi Laverne, Everly's mother. She cast a spell on Juniper and told her that the monster will hunt her and bring her back, but as long as she stays running, the monster won't be able to get to her. So that's how she was able to escape Leon. So Juniper ran from Leon all night, and she was terrified of him because all she could really see was his eyes kind of stalking her as she was running nonstop. Zane confronts Juniper, and we learn that Zane is about a 1,000 years old, but that's barely 30 in demon years. So to give you a a little bit of a better understanding too, book one, Leon, he's about 400 years old. Mm -hmm. Book two, we're progressing. We got Zane. He's about a thousand years old. And obviously the older you are, the more power you have. You know, you're just more powerful. You've especially soul hunting. Yeah. With the soul hunting, he's amassed even more power. Yes. So Zane sends his Leon outside. So he goes to his friend. Leon tells Zane that Kent has freed him and that Ray has the grimoire. Leon also calls out Zane for having a human in his house, but he doesn't give too much info away. He's kind of keeping Juniper on the DL. Zane fills Juniper in on Kent now being demonless and less protected. They are trying to come up with a game plan. Zane informs Juniper that Heidi and Everly are witches and very powerful at that, but they need to be careful when they go after them. They have been trying to find... Everly and Heidi, but they have had no luck. But they do find Jeremiah, and Juniper has Zane follow him while she follows Victoria. So they're doing some stakeout. They're trying to yep. get some intel, trying to gain and figure out what their next plan is. Zane is following Jeremiah and is getting more and more repulsed by him as the day goes on. He's also thinking a lot about Juniper and how he wants to be with her without sex being involved. He just what? likes her Imagine company. That. Oh my God, you'd say it ain't so. Zane just gets more and more perfect. He does. I really like Zane. So Zane continues to follow Jeremiah to the lake where he and a few friends meet up. Jeremiah has his friend throw him a box that has a knife covered in dried blood. Jeremiah killed Marcus and did what his dad and sister couldn't. He's pretty much bragging to the other cult members about how great he is. Fucking asshole. Seriously. He's convinced he isn't the Hadley sacrifice and that Victoria is. He tells his group if they hear or see anything from Everly that they report it to him, not anyone else. Zane has told Juniper about all of his findings while watching Jeremiah. Victoria didn't give Juniper anything, but they now know that Everly is missing. So remember book one, Everly goes missing. Yep. Still on track. Juniper starts talking about how she is going to make Jeremiah bleed and how she is going to kill him, which is just foreplay for Juniper and Zane. Zane crashes Juniper up against the window and kisses her hard as she wraps her arms and legs around him. Juniper then bites Zane, knowing he enjoys the pain. He then slaps her, taking her by surprise. Juniper tells him she wants it harder, so Zane slaps her again and demands she tell him what she wants. Oh my goodness. So she tells him that she wants him to wreck her. 
and he starts tossing her around the room, but catching her before she hits anything. So, like, really flashing his demon abilities and, like, supernatural strength mm-hmm. and whatnot. He throws her onto the couch and uses his powers to bind her in place. So those phantom fingers. I really enjoy these phantom hands. Right? I don't know why, but, like, that does something for me. He then starts to strip and tease her, biting up her legs as he goes. He starts to go down on her and then asks if she can come just from pain alone. He starts to slap her legs and then slaps her clit. He pulls lube out of the coffee table as he lathers it on his dick. This was funny because I remember texting you. did text me about this. (laughs) During this part, I was like, really? Lube in the coffee table? You're like, do you know anyone who has lube in their coffee table? I'm like, no, but I also don't know any demons. So (laughs) I can't really see. But I was like, it's very on brand for Zane. Yeah. He probably has lube in every drawer of his house. It's a lot of lube. Yeah, but he's, he can use it. <laughs> they do have a lot of sex. Though. Yes. There's a lot more sex in this book than in book one. I think so too. So after he lathers his dick up with lube, he starts to have anal with Juniper while slapping her clit because she's still a little sore from their last encounter. So he's using the other hole. What a gentleman. Just like book one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They did anal really fast in that one, too. That was their second time having sex. Here we go. This is their third. We made it to three. I feel like there's been more time in between, though. Yeah, there has. Because the first time they have sex in the woods... It was years ago. It, right. There was a big time get trap. Yeah. Yeah. Juniper then bites his fingers and makes him bleed and then spits it in his face, which just spurs Zane on. They nasty. Yes, this scene has a lot of degradation throughout, mainly Zane calling Juniper his dirty little slut. So like a lot going on. So Juniper is out on the hunt again and she is watching Victoria with Ray. During this, she's thinking about how her and Victoria were so tight and how the person who tried to kill her is right there. Because Juniper was misled by the whole Hadley family. I mean, we briefly touched on it, but like Victoria led her set her up to be sacrificed and victoria was also juniper's best friend juniper's always had the rep of being like a bitch she doesn't have a lot of friends and like victoria liked her but like not and she really. was really close with her and like her family and like juniper grew up poor and like victoria's family would like buy her new clothes for school she stayed there a lot she right. was kind of like an extended family member of the Hadleys. But they were only keeping her close because they needed her to kill her. Yep. It's so fucked. So as Juniper is watching Ray and Victoria, she notices another figure outside, which is Everly. Everly looks scared and starts to run as Juniper chases her down to an alley and she turns the corner and Everly is just gone, vanished. But she notices something weird. So she kind of approaches this like section and it turns out it's Everly's magic. She was trying to cloak herself to hide from Juniper. Everly is able to get away for the second time when Zane shows up. Juniper notices a piece of paper on the ground with notes and an X on it. And she tells Zane he doesn't have to track the witch anymore because she's pretty sure she knows where to find her. They found a map. They found a map. They found a map. Map, 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 map. <laughs> map! So Zane and Juniper are following the map to get to the witch house where Everly and the archdemon are, which seems to have magical wards making it difficult to find. Like they're following it, but like the trail just seems to like get longer and longer and like i think that they make the comments of like i've i swear we've been here before yeah like we passed this tree or we passed this rock or whatever so there's definitely like some magic deterring them from actually getting to the house and then the archdemon finds them and begins to have a blowout fight with daddy zane and the hierarchy of hell archdemons outrank regular demons even thousand year old demons. Yeah, even thousand year old like badass soul hunter demons. Like Callum is still stronger than Zane. Mm-hmm. And arch demons are like the royalty of hell. They're also known as the god killer demons. Yes. So they're battling it out, and Zane is just getting his ass handed to him. Now he is being able he's to. He's holding his he's own. He's holding but his not own well. <laughs> he's probably getting you know seventy five percent damage where the Archdemon's only getting like 25% damage. Everly comes up and puts a stop to Callum, the Archdemon, and Zane's fighting and has a one-on-one chat with Miss Juniper to find out her intentions. She's basically like, 
are you here to kill me? Right, because obviously Everly knows Juniper. She was there mm-hmm. at the failed sacrifice. So Everly is kind of trying to gauge Juniper's like, intentions. where are we at? Yeah, like, where do we stand? Are you trying to murder me or do you need something from me? And they come to an understanding about the past because they kind of hash out everything from that night and, like, Everly's role and stuff and her feelings with the family. And they strike a bargain to stay out of each other's way while Juniper kills the Hadleys and the Libri, and Everly kills the god. Yep, so Everly has her own plans in motion with Callum. And Everly lets Juniper know that the Halloween party would be the best time to kill Kent. You want to kill my dad? Here's one to do it. Everly, good looking out, because she also hates her dad. I mean, her dad looked at her as an object, a thing of possession, because she's magical. She has magical capabilities. And power, like that's all he saw with her, and he's like, I'm going to use you. And that's probably exactly why he had the affair with Heidi to produce an heir Mm -hmm. to yield whenever he wanted. Like, it'll be interesting to find out more about that, hopefully, in her book. I'm very interested in Everly's book. I'm very intrigued on how this whole series is going to wrap up. Same. So Juniper and Vane are able to leave the witch's lair kind of sort of unscathed. Maybe a little bit of damage, but you know. At least they're alive. And Juniper is scared of her growing feelings for Zane as she was worried about his safety while he was dealing with the archdemon and like while she was kind of sequestered with just Everly, she's kind of like, where's my demon? Give me my demon back. Yeah, and, and Zane- she, yeah, and she like is actually really like worried about mm-hmm. Zane. And Zane was like, where's my human? Give me my human back. Oh yeah, he was fighting just as much as Juniper was. And the asshole remarks between Calum and Zane were really funny. Yes. Their banter was funny because Callum is just like, I could squish you like a bug. Shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up. But like Zane and like Callum was also pushing Zane. Mm -hmm. He knew exactly what to say to kind of get him to lash out. So Callum has an excuse to hurt Mm -hmm. him more. (laughs) Yeah, it was great. Back at the house, Zane tells Juniper he wants her to dominate him. But before he gives up control, he wants to know what her sigh was about when they returned to the house. And Juniper lets Zane know it was because his place feels like home to her now. She's finally starting to feel happy and that there may be a reason that she survived all she's been through. Love that. I think that's so sweet. And they're she actually having a conversation. Vulnerable. I know. And she's actually opening up. I mean, he kind of pushed her too. I mean, yeah, but she could have fought a little bit more. I thought that she kind of gave into that request easier than she had been previously. Because yeah. the reward is she gets to dom That's true. Zane. That's true. She's probably like, ooh, I'm not going to pass up this opportunity. So enter Dominatrix Juniper. And she's let it known that she's kind of a switch. She's done this before. So Zane leads her to towards his little chest of demon sex toys. This freaking chest, man. It's like things that you would find at a sex store just like intensified. Also think like medieval torture devices. Yeah, like think of a ball gag that was made of metal. Because that's exactly what he pulls out. (laughs) Like, oh my gosh. And Juniper's kind of like, um. Where was this earlier? I could have shut you up a long time ago. (laughs) And he's like, make me. So she does. She makes him get on his knees and she inserts that metal ball gag. So she puts the ball gag in Zane's mouth and then she like goes behind him and starts taunting him. And she also pulls out a metal flogger. So Juniper is like behind Zane teasing him and then she starts taking off articles of clothing like one at a time and throwing them so he can like see the t-shirt land. See the bra land. And the great thing that I really, really loved about this scene is that Zane is obviously playing the submissive role, but he could easily break through Mm -hmm. any of the stuff that like Juniper is like restraining him with or whatever it is. But he is showing that so much self-control. Yeah. And is letting her tease him even though it's driving him crazy and he wants to react. Mm -hmm. And that just goes to show also that Zayn will give Juniper whatever she needs, even if it's something that's uncomfortable for him. Like he'll sacrifice his needs. And I love that. I think that that's so cute. So good. And this scene was so, I liked this scene. I liked the reverse. Yeah, because we've gotten so much of Zayn dominating Juniper. It was great, like you said, to have this reversal of roles. Because, like, they're both switches. Yeah. And, like, Zane 
likes pain. And so like he's definitely down for anything. Then she starts like taking the flogger and like caressing it all over different body parts and then whipping him. So it's like a little bit of tease. Pain. Pain. <laughs> a little bit of tease. Pain. <laughs> and she's like, you're looking a little tense, Zane. And then taunting him. So not only is she taunting him with like these physical actions, then she's verbally taunting him. And just he's getting more and more tense and driven. And then she starts to like undo his pants and let his monstrous demon dick out. She's like, oh, it's getting a little tight there, a little <laughs> uncomfy. Oh, poor little baby demon. Let, let me, me help you. that for you. And she's like, do you want more? I'm so glad you're being so quiet, Zane. And she is thriving on the fact that he is gagged and that he is also playing the role of the submissive and like she can taunt him and do whatever the fuck that she wants. She's living for this. Yeah, and she's getting aroused and excited by this. So not only is she like turning Zane on, she's turning herself on. And she's like, do you want a little taste? So then she starts to like finger herself in front of him. And then she like turns around and gets in front of him and straddles him. And she's like, hmm, too bad about that gag. Can't taste me without, you know, <laughs> can't taste me right now, but I know you want to. So then she starts riding him, but not fully letting him inside of her yet. It's like just, just the just, tip, right? Or just kind of almost like a dry hump oh, sort okay, of thing. Yeah. Like it's it's you not know. entering. No. And so again, Zane's almost at his breaking point. So now that she's like straddling him and grinding up on him, he's trying to use those phantom hands since he can't touch her. So he's trying to do the phantom touching. And she's like, uh-uh, better get those phantom hands off of me. <laughs> she's like, not today. And then she decides she's going to carve her name into Zane. She's like, you carved your name into me. I'm going to carve mine into you. And he is here for it. He doesn't shy away from this idea. No. At all. So she does. Right in his chest, right? Like at his collarbone. Yeah. Okay. And as she's doing this, then she does actually kind of. Fully fuck him. Yeah. <laughs> so she's right in him while carving, carving her up. name. And as soon as she's done carving her name into him, he can't take it anymore. He's done. He breaks free and just ravages her. Love to see it. And he was so into having her name carved onto him. She went pretty deep, not super deep, but like it could have healed on its own. But he really likes the idea of having her name on him. So then he makes sure that it scars, that it scars which I thought was kind of sweet. Yeah, me too. That was a great sex scene. I think that that was my favorite smutty scene in the book. Oh, that was my favorite. I, you know, and it's weird because I tend to like more of a male dom scene when I'm reading. But like this one, like I was really here for it. It was so good. Yeah, I liked it. I just, I liked also the Juniper carving her name. I could see both of them wanting slash liking that. There's good balance with them. So after the sex capade, it's, it's Halloween time. So Juniper and Zane, they're out planning their Halloween costumes, doing a little shopping. And Juniper, during this, gets a visit from a new creature. New creature is on the oh, scene. Oh, this thing. Which is a watcher. Fuck this monster demon thing. Creepy. And a watcher is a parasitic monster that is attracted to the prey of other creatures. And it feeds off of fear. And it'll cause hallucinations and other sensations to drive fear. And it also looks creepy. It has no skin. It's just like if someone was... It's like pale with like red eyes, melty looking. The description of this thing has like no eyelids. And it just like sits there. Yeah. It, it like stalks you. It never actually like touches it's you. Not a, it's not a monster that is going to attack you and kill you. The whole purpose of it is, like, how it gets its energy is from your fear. your fear. So it, like, invades not only your personal space. Like, it will get up close and personal Oh, it'll you. come up to you. It will all sorts of invade your bubble. But then it also, like, enters your mind. Yeah. And Fuck off. Freaky. Just, and it, it, yeah, it can make you believe that you are, like, in your memories. Mm -hmm. And it will take you out of your, like, Manip reality. Yeah, it manipulates you, causes you to hallucinate. It's just awful not great not here for this so zane is like trying to let juniper know like it feeds off of your fear if you know this you can control it and just 
don't give in to what it's doing to you. Yeah, and I think it's almost like the more you like have eye contact, that's kind of what the more it stimulate, can get to, yeah. Right, it stimulates that fear. So it's like if you can just ignore it, it can't do anything unless you give it the power to do something. Mm-hmm. But like you have to be proactively like fighting against yes. it. So we skip to the Halloween party at the Hadleys. And we already know that Juniper and Zane assist Ray when she got roofied by Jeremiah. Later in the evening, they spot Kent smoking a cigar and holding a pistol. So this was after Kent's confrontation with Ray and Leon. I'm pretty sure that they see Ray and Leon make their run, like make their exit after that encounter. Mm -hmm. And then that's when they see Kent, right? And they wind up sneaking up and confronting Kent. They're able to subdue him and carry him off to the garden shed where they torture and kill him and fuck over Kent's dying body. You can't kill someone without then fucking in front of it. Because Juniper was like, the last thing I want Kent to see is just me having the power and loving myself, my body, and just like... I've won. I've won. And I think that it's great because... Kent, so first of all, when they subdue him, they're able to get that amulet off mm-hmm. of him. And, and they so, bury it. And they bury it. And so Z- Zane is now able to actually physically hurt Kent. Mm-hmm. So, like, Zane is kind of like, Junie, like, let me hurt the bad mm-hmm. guy. And she's like, okay. So, like, he just freaking goes to town, breaks bones, like, really just torturing, torturing. Kent. But Kent, just like all bad guys, go down as a coward. Yes. He's begging for his life. And now, like, put me out of my misery. But also then still taunts Juniper as well. Like, And still stands by kind of what he did. Yeah. And was like, you don't don't say no to a god. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Trying to justify his actions. And Juniper's just like, fuck you. Fuck your god. Fuck your children. (laughs) Fuck the cult. Anyone who believes this bullshit, they're all going down. And it's going to be at my hands. Yeah. And then Juniper is the one who ultimately kills Kent. Mm -hmm. So one down. One down. Many more to go. After the euphoric murder, Zane decides he wants to take Juniper to a hell on earth party. The party is in a power plant and they meet Hannah, a demon and a former lover of Zane. He also bears some metal. I think that one's in his eyebrow. And her human companion, Sadie. I want a story of them. Right? They're dynamic. They're really cute. Yeah. Like. Their dynamic was very fun. Hannah comes off as like this badass demon. And then Sadie's just like this like. She just like bounces. Yeah. Like, she's like this peppy <laughs> cheerleader ball of energy and just positivity. And Hannah is very much the same kind of demeanor and characteristics of Zane, Leon and right. Zane. Yeah. And I really liked them. I liked their dynamic. And like we learned that Hannah save Sadie from an abusive relationship. Mm-hmm. That's She sold her soul to Hannah yep. to get rid of her abusive ex. And yep. she's never been happier. Never been happier. And Hannah's never been happier. And now they're like in love. And, and this is and this is the first time Juniper is being around other demons and other humans, humans who that, have already sold their soul. Mm-hmm. So she's kind of like, maybe this isn't all bad. bad. And she loves the party. This party, this hell on earth party sounds like a freaking riot. Yeah. Sounds so fun. <laughs> and after getting a drink of Hell's Liquor, a loosened up Juniper and Zane go to the dance floor and grind it out. And Zane pleasures her with a finger bang. Because, you know, these parties, anything goes. I yeah. mean, there's public s- displays of sex So much going public, on. like, everywhere you're walking is, like, like, people naked, people doing fucking, it. like, what? <laughs> Just, there are no rules other than consent. But everyone there is consenting. Yeah, you're going to learn some things and see some things yeah. at this hell on earth party. And I think that I think that Zane is starting to pick up that Juniper likes to watch and potentially perform, mm-hmm. right? Oh yes. Cuz Juniper she does. She loves this voyeurism and the public play. Like the finger bang and situation like everyone with them being aroused like everyone like within the nearby vicinity is like watching. And like into it and then more. And also, so I think what adds, starts happening. I think what adds to this too is first, Juniper and Zane are very good looking people. Yes. I think just in general. Mm-hmm. They like catch eyes. Like they're both very good looking. And then combine it, it's almost like, wow, these people are too beautiful. Like they deserve each other. Yeah. But then on top of it. Then like that energy just spills over. Yeah. And on top of it, 
demons like love that sexual energy and like mm-hmm. Juniper and Zane got a lot of that going on. Plus, they literally came to this party after killing Kent. So they are drenched in blood and like everyone there is loving it. Because they're just like, yes, like give us more of this energy. After the little dance floor episode, Zane's like, all right, let's take a little break. That was a lot, but loved it. And they meet back up with Hannah and Sadie where we find out the backstory, how Sadie sold her soul to Hannah to get rid of the abusive husband. And Juniper finds out about how there were other soul hunters after her years ago back in the diner. And Zane warned them off. She had no idea about that. And Hannah... Spilled the beans. Yeah. She let that one slip. So she realizes Zane's been looking out for her this entire time. For a while. And it really hits her about, like, kind of how much he cares about her. And probably starting to realize how much she cares about him in reverse. Mm -hmm. Because she already knows it, but she still is a little in denial. Yeah. She's scared a little bit. She doesn't like relying and depending and... She's not used to being with people. Nope. She was a nomad for three years after the hospital. But now she's she's ready to accept it. So ready, in fact, that Juniper lets Zane know she's ready to receive his mark because he's been wanting to pierce her for throughout this whole book now. Yeah, he's kind of been like, I can't wait to get my medal in her. (laughs) She's finally ready to receive it, and it just so happens at this hell on earth party, we have the. Famous Bond jewelry maker of hell in attendance. Vian? Yep, Vian. So it's time to make introductions with Vian and get Juniper pierced. Okay, so Juniper and Zane, they find Vian, who picks out Juniper's jewelry that he crafts himself. He finds the medals and crafts them and everything. Vian is an interesting demon, nearly seven feet tall with lots of metal all over him. And he also has like a group, like he has groupies, it seems like. I mean, you also got to market your goods, right? Right. So he has like people in chains just kind of chilling behind him. Interesting, dude. Juniper and Zane decide to do the piercing in public. Zane gives Juniper the option of going somewhere private. But Juniper likes the public play, like we've already mentioned. So they start to attract an audience. Zane teases Juniper and ends up going down on her in the middle of the club. And right before she comes, he stops, orders her to sit up on her knees as he is standing above her. Zane then pierces Juniper's tongue and she orgasms from the pain. Oh, Junie. But it doesn't end there. Zane tells her how good she did, like praises her. Lots of good dirty talk and sexy, like during the sexy scene, like a lot of dirty and sexy talk leading up to this piercing. I just wanted to make sure you guys knew If you thought Leon was a good dirty talker, Zane, even better. Oh, for sure. And so once Juniper is pierced, Zane pulls her up to straddle his face and he finishes what he started. Zane then carries Juniper out of the club since she is a noodle. (laughs) Yep, she has been satiated. Oh, yeah. She's living life, man. It's the next morning after the club and after they killed Kent. So Juniper and Zane are in pretty good spirits, even though Zane is pissed that the papers are calling Kent's death a suicide. Mm -hmm. He's like, that was me. I want all the credit. And then Juniper's like, it's probably a good thing. We don't need people thinking that there's a murderer going around. Like, like coming after us. I know you did it, honey. It's okay. (laughs) Good job, you little murderer. (laughs) Juniper leaves the house alone to go grab breakfast when she runs into Victoria. Victoria sees Juniper and starts to run away as Juniper takes chase. Before Juniper can catch up to Victoria, a van pulls up and Jeremiah gets out with some of his goons and they kidnap Victoria in broad daylight. Juniper decides to follow the van and it leads her to the mine and Juniper knows that they are about to sacrifice Victoria. So Juniper follows the cult and is hiding in St. Thaddeus where she can also feel the watcher. He's near. He's following her. And he's in the church kind of, and he actually gets up right on her at one point. Like, where she can feel his breath. I'm just like, this is so so creepy. creepy. She's ignoring the Watcher and is trying to stay present and not get sucked back into the past. Because this is just traumatic. I mean, this is where she was attempted to be sacrificed. Like, all these memories. Is it bad I would rather deal with the Eld Beast than the Watcher? Yeah, yeah. Because the Eld Beast, you just fight and kill. Yeah. Just shoot them in the head. This thing, like, getting, like, encroaching in your your personal space and, like, breathing on you and then, like... Like, back the fuck up. 
Boo boo. Like I don't like that. No, me neither. I would rather have like this sense of like physical danger to fight than psychological warfare. Mm. So Jeremiah has clearly taken over for Kent and is giving a speech about the next sacrifice, Victoria, as she is tied up and yelling, trying to get free. And she's kind of doing the same shit that Juniper did. You know me. Don't do this. You can't do this. This is all bullshit. Yada, yada, yada. Full circle moment for her a little bit. Jeremiah takes out the knife that he used to kill Marcus and starts to brutally cut Victoria. Juniper wants Victoria to die, but not like this. She doesn't want the god to get another sacrifice. So she follows the cult up to the mill because she is going to save Victoria once they throw her down. Save her to murder her later. Exactly. Makes sense. So Juniper is really hoping Zane will show up because the whole cult is here. But she can't take them out without his help. But she also forgot her phone at home. Why does this always happen? Why do people leave without their phones? I never leave without my phone. Are you psychotic? Take your freaking phone. I leave without my phone on the yeah, regular. Okay, I guess. I guess. Yeah, you would. That would be me. Yeah. You people drive me crazy. I don't go anywhere without my phone. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so funny to see you go off on this and I'm just like. <laughs> yeah, sorry, guilty. I do that quite well, frequently. Well, if you ever get sacrificed and you don't have your phone, you have no one to play by yourself. You're not wrong. <laughs> so Victoria is still begging not to be sacrificed, and Jeremiah kind of gets fed up and asks if anyone else would sacrifice themselves. And a random follow- follower steps forward saying that, yes, I will. And Jeremiah literally just slits his throat right then and there and throws him down the mine shaft. Now Victoria is really freaking out. Rightfully so. So Jeremiah, after he gives this God this sacrifice that wasn't one of the original three, he starts to hear God and everyone starts to hear the God speaking. And he's kind of like getting a little bit of like power from the God. Nothing Mm -hmm. crazy, but like you can tell something is happening. So after this obvious God sighting, because now everyone's like, oh my God, it's real. Like, oh. Jeremiah then pulls Victoria up and slits her throat before shoving her down the mine. Juniper really can't believe what she just saw and is starting to realize that this is really bad and that Jeremiah may be worse than Kent. Oh, definitely. So tentacle-like things start to crawl out of the mine and start to go into Jeremiah via his like mouth and ears. Very no. creepy. No, no, Very no, creepy no, no, vibes. No, 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 no. Yeah. Finally, Zane shows up. And ushers Juniper the fuck out of there as fast as he can because he knows the god is closer to escaping and he wants Juniper Juniper to be as far away from this place as possible. Yeah, he's like, fuck the plan. Fuck this place. Yeah, like the next chapter, the next chapter starts off in in Zane's point of view and he's literally like, fuck this. Fuck the town. Fuck everything. We're all fucked. (laughs) Like literally. We're getting the fuck out of here. (laughs) So Zane knows how bad this is and is ushering Juniper back to his car. Juniper is a little confused about what happened to Jeremiah. So Zane explains that a part of the God is now inside Jeremiah. His human body won't be able to sustain the God's powers forever. But while he does, he's no longer just another human. But Zane doesn't know how much strength Jeremiah is now possessing. And he doesn't want to find out. He does not want to fuck around and find out. No, he does not want to be anywhere near this situation. Zane tries to get Juniper to run, and he tells her that she is done and that he will take care of Jeremiah, but Juniper isn't going to be anywhere near this. He is like, you are done this fight. It's too dangerous for you. I'm handling it now. Knowing Juniper, she obviously fights this. She's like, I'm not leaving you. And she ends up confessing that she loves Zane And she isn't going to leave him in danger alone. He has given her a purpose and an eternity, but they are doing this together. They come to the conclusion that Zane will do all the fighting and that Juniper has to stay hidden and out of the way no matter what happens. So as the pair make their way back into town, they pass the supermarket, which, you know, in book one, Ray has an encounter with Jeremiah and Leon and all them. And it is now burned to the ground. And they realize things have really escalated quickly. They make their way to the Hadley's Manor and notice a shit ton of mushrooms have sprouted everywhere. And there are cars lining the driveway. Zane tries to get Juniper to promise that if things go sideways, she runs, but she low-key refuses. She's still like, no. Zane leaves Juniper and goes into the house where a few of the cult followers are hanging out, but Jeremiah is not among them. Zane works fast, 
and slaughters about the five to six people in the house, and he makes sure to be as savage as possible to make a statement. He also writes welcome home jay in their blood on the wall yeah and there's like intestines strewn about like he was decapitating these people he was ripping them to shreds it is gruesome gruesome like this room is now just covered in blood and people so imagine a quentin tarantino-esque scene here that's the vibe i got very gory and then within a few minutes jeremiah enters the house and zane is just casually waiting in the slaughter room he's like hey buddy how's it going welcome So Jeremiah enters the room with a couple other people who are all geared up with guns and helmets and the whole nine yards. He's also a little twitchy, Zane notices. Jeremiah recognizes Zane from the party, the bartender guy, and Zane uses his energy trick to blast the guys across the room and they fly and hit the wall and go down. Zane casually walks over to Jeremiah, but Jeremiah jumps up faster than any human should be able to and punches Z in the face. The impact a lot more than just what a human could do. So Zane has overcompensated on his powers and he's like, oh shit. Okay, this is about to be real. It's almost like he forgot that, you know, Jeremiah has like God powers now. He probably was hoping that the God powers weren't super strong, but he's unfortunately wrong. So Zane realizes that he is he has underestimated Jeremiah and the God's power. They start to fight and Jeremiah is holding his own. So Zane tries to get an advantage again by hiding, but he's not fooling Jeremiah. Jeremiah is holding his own and is low-key kicking Zane's ass as his goons start firing bullets at Zane. Jeremiah has Zane right where he wants him and stabs him with something that hurts extremely bad. Jeremiah has shoved the amulet, Kent's amulet, that they... Buried buried and forgot about deep into Zane's skin. Juniper and Zane forgot to unbury the medallion the night they killed Kent. So now Jeremiah knows for sure that it was him and not Leon who killed Daddy Dearest. The goons shoot a few more bullets at Zane and he realizes that he isn't healing. The amulet is actually sucking up all of his powers and his ability to heal. So he's really fucked. This is not good news. Jeremiah then sees the marking of Juniper's name on Zane's skin and knows that Victoria was actually probably telling him the truth about Juniper being back in town right before they kidnapped her. Jeremiah can smell that Juniper is near and Zane is trying his hardest to convince him that she's not around. He then sends his goons to go searching for Juniper and to bring her back to him alive. Juniper has been hiding in the woods and saw Zane kill all the cult followers in the house, but she hasn't been able to see Zane since Jeremiah has come back. So she really has no idea what's happening until Jeremiah comes into sight and is dragging Zane behind him and she knows shit is bad. She sees the guys with the guns approaching and is able to take down the first one pretty like instantly and silently. She she gets in and out of there fast. She's efficient. But goon number two doesn't go as easily, but she ultimately ends up being able to take him down. And the creepy old watcher's there and comes over to stalk his newest prey and realizes, like there's this moment where you like, Juniper, it's Juniper, this kid that is slowly dying, and the Watcher. And she's like, oh, fuck, I don't want to have to deal with this shit, too. And the Watcher kind of, like, looks from her to him and is trying to gauge which prey is best. Ultimately goes for the one that is kind of dying and literally swallows the guy's head whole. And Juniper's like, fuck this. She, she's mm. like, that's enough for me. I'm not fucking around. So Juniper makes her way up the hill to Zane and sees how badly in shape he is as Jeremiah is covered in Zane's blood saying something that she can't hear. Zane tries to get Juniper to leave since Jeremiah has just summoned a reaper. So Zane's not doing too hot. He's terribly injured and unable to heal and can feel his powers draining. Jeremiah starts taunting Zane about calling a reaper and Zane starts taunting back. You know, humans shouldn't know about reapers or how to call them, but Jeremiah lets Zane know who really is in charge, the God. So this is the God's knowledge, how to call a reaper. This isn't Jeremiah. This is God's power. So Jeremiah is going to call the Reaper to break Leon and then ultimately kill Zane. Juniper has now made herself known and Zane is trying to get her to run. The Reaper has been summoned and he is massive, like 10 feet tall. He has five eyes, crazy sharp teeth and like 
hundreds of them. Very scary looking. Jeremiah is able to make a deal with the Reaper, so the Reaper agrees to break Leon and then kill Zane, since the Reaper was summoned with Zane's blood. Juniper has since run, and Jeremiah taunts Zane about that, and then gets ready to leave since he has a sacrifice to attend to. Jeremiah then lastly promises Zane that when he returns, he will be free, and it will be a very different world. I don't want to be a part of that world. No. So now we kind of have more backstory as to the Reaper, because, you know, in Leon's story, the just Reaper... just kind of showed up out of nowhere. Right. We kind of don't know how, what, where, why, when. Yeah, we, like, heard the roar, and it was just like, oh, and shit. And Leon knows what it is. But other than that, so now we kind of got, we got more plot holes filling in for yeah. you. We now know what happens and how the Reaper is summoned. So Juniper ran, but she only ran to hide behind the gardening shed and bid her time. She makes her way back to Zane, where they have a conversation about her not leaving, and she tells Zane she will fight the Reaper, but she isn't leaving him ever. So they're still going, like, Zane is still trying to get her to run, Juniper's still being like, no. <laughs> Let's not waste time, people. I know. Zane has Juniper cut out the medallion from his back, which is very painful. Juniper then has Zane crush the medallion to be able to use it as bullets against the Reaper. Very smart. Brilliant. Zane is, is, st is still incredibly weak and has no chance against the Reaper. But then they both notice a light on in the house with a human shadow behind it. And that is exactly what he needs. A Time soul. for a new soul. They make their way back into the house in search of the person who is still alive. Zane can sense the Reaper is coming back and that their time is running out. So they make their way into the room. They know that it's Meredith, Kent's wife, that is there. And you know, she's also on Juniper's hit list. So perfect. Right. Perfect. She starts yelling at them, specifically Juniper, for ruining her and her kid's life. She keeps rambling on about how Victoria made the sacrifice and she should have been saved but the fact that Juniper escaped is now the reason why her daughter is dead. Logic is very backwards. You guys shouldn't have been part of a cult to begin with. That you knew you were going to have to sacrifice one of your children. You're blaming a victim. Oh my gosh. I just can't with Meredith. Like Meredith this. sucks. Like, and yeah. I, there's so many things wrong with that monologue. For sure. So Zane ultimately makes a deal with Meredith. She will give him her soul and he will let her live. He won't kill her. So she gives in and agrees. So Zane marks her with his name and power instantly floods his body. So he is becoming stronger. The soul did what it needed to do. But he didn't like the taste of it. No. It was very. No, he was like, ooh. He's like, this is a very foul and just rank yeah. soul. It's like, eh, that tracks. So Meredith then notices Zane's now black eyes and starts to panic. He and leveled up. He did level up. And she tries to make her exit when Juniper steps in and just slits Meredith's throat. She never made any promises. And, like, that obviously got a chuckle out of Zane because he's like, yeah, she wasn't part of the deal. So we're good. <laughs> it's like, I may have to deal with the council later, but... Worth it. So the Reaper is back, and he has his hands wrapped around Zane's throat. Zane notices that Leon was able to injure the Reaper a little, and that makes him really proud that he kind of was able to get in a few hits. Because guess what? Zane is now an archdemon. Yep. So they start fighting, and Z is going for the Reaper's injuries and is holding his own, but he can't really take the Reaper down until Juniper manages to shoot the Reaper right in the eye with one of the medallion bullets, which instantly has, like, an effect and wounds the Reaper badly. Unfortunately, it doesn't stop him totally. He gets a hold of Juniper, but he gives... Zane the perfect opportunity to sink his teeth deep into the Reaper. And the Reaper being badly injured now makes his leave, but lets Zane know that all Reapers will know his face. So he should be very careful the next time he's wandering in hell. He'll deal with that later. Yeah, whatever. He leaves and Zane rushes over to where Juniper is lying limply on the ground. She wakes up and Zane is grateful for her brilliant idea to bring the Reaper to his knees. Not long after this... Jeremiah shows back up. Fuck this kid, man. <sighs> so Jeremiah is looking a little worse for wear as his God is draining him and he shows back up with all of the cult following. Like you can tell that Jeremiah is like decomposing from the inside out. Yeah. Because like he's oozing like black liquid from like his pores and other orifices. Yeah. And it's, it's just, just not. A mess. So gross. Yeah. So he's pissed that Zane is alive. 
Juniper is there and his Reaper is gone. So all these, these three things, he's furious. Jeremiah taunts that the third sacrifice has been completed and that he did something not even his dad could do. And he throws a, t- a temper tantrum. Like Another he literally, God temper tantrum. He literally is throwing a temper tantrum. We temper had tantrum. a temper tantrum book one. We gotta have a temper tantrum book two. Yeah, Jeremy is just like a little bitch. Zane t- taunts the God since the God is not free and is still trapped in Jeremiah's body. Zane gives them to the count of three and then starts shooting the people in the white cloaks. So the cult members and all chaos, you know, breaks loose. Yep. The god has now lost his cool and is calling his tentacles out of the ground and out of Je- uh, Jeremiah. Jeremiah starts to grow in size and more black stuff is oozing out of him. His limbs have become tentacles, like crazy batshit stuff. And isn't this the point where Jeremiah kind of now realizes he's breaking down too and is like, kind of. why are you doing this to me? Yeah. He's also going on about uh, Juniper and how she will not escape him again. He manages to get Juniper in one of his tentacles as Jeremiah now does not have arms and legs, but tentacles. <laughs> Creepy. And the God is able to get Juniper to start panicking and thinking about the mine and her failed sacrifices, kind of bringing out that PTSD. But Zane now, having leveled up to an arc demon, is able to attack Jeremiah slash the God to take him down. The God ends up leaving Jeremiah because Jeremiah ultimately failed. His body was decomposing. And as we know from book one, Ray is a failed sacrifice. Yep. So the sacrifice did not go the way that they were planning. And the God has abandoned Jeremiah. And Juniper's kind of like, are you surprised? Do you think he was going to show you mercy? Do you think he was going to be good to you? You think he was going to continue to help you? Like, are you that delusional? Yes, they are. Juniper is kind of, you know, taunting Jeremiah. But Jeremiah is also kind of taunting Juniper because he kind of tries to make his escape into the house. And they follow, obviously. And during this, Jeremiah is taunting Juniper by telling her about Marcus and how he screamed and begged for his life and how he would kill him again. And, you know, all this really fucked up shit. And... Juniper starts shooting at Jeremiah as he makes his way, you know, deeper into the home. She's kind of like, it's time that I just kill you. It's time for you to die. So Jeremiah is still trying to understand why the God has left him. And Juniper and Zane find him deeper into the house. As they are inside, the storm outside is still raging. And lightning actually hits the house. And it's only a matter of time until the gas line explodes. So Zane's like, we're running out of time. We need to get out of here. Juniper gives a good execution speech and then kills Jeremiah by shooting him. He thought that she was a sheep, but she was really a wolf and she came back biting. The fire spreads fast. Zane is confronting Juniper and letting her now, letting her know her hunt is finally over, but his hunt for her never will be. Swoon. Mm. So cute. There were so many good swoony moments. There with, were. like, Zane professing things to Juniper. So as they are getting ready, they also say the I love yous again. And Zane officially says it back to Juniper. We've known it for a while. We've though. known it, yes. And Juniper finally feels free. Because not only did they ultimately kill Jeremiah, but they killed the whole cult. Like, Zane took down the cult members that were at the house. So yep. everyone is wiped out at this point. As they are getting ready to go, they see a figure coming out of the woods, and it's Leon. Hey, Remember bud. from book one? So Juniper fills Leon in on the on all the death and events of the night, and Leon tells her that Ray is safe and hidden. Juniper then reaches out and shakes Leon's hand and tells him that she forgives him. Juniper and Zane make their exit and head to the ocean, since that is where Juniper wants to go first. I liked this scene because it felt like a baptism moment for her a little bit. It was like freeing. Yeah, it was mm-hmm. very like washing away all the past traumas. Yeah. Because Juniper then wades out into the water feeling free. And she also notices that Zane's eyes have gone back to gold and they're no longer black, but they do look different. They're a little like a darker hue, but they're not solely black anymore. Yeah, it's like the white has kind of been replaced with black. Yeah. Juniper now has her whole life ahead of her, but she doesn't know what to do. And she still is concerned that she's too broken to do anything. But Zane comforts her saying that they could go anywhere and he will always follow. And I love this part too because he's like something about 
all your broken and shattered pieces. I want them all. You are perfect to me. And it just like catches light. Yes. Or just, like, it was so, it was so sweet. beautiful. Yeah. No, it was like, like perfect. Oh. And so then we get an epilogue. It's a few months have passed. Zane and Juniper are in Vermont. The demon Hannah has recommended a good therapist that actually sold her soul to her a while ago. And Juniper has been having ses sessions, which Zane thinks is really good and healthy. Zane is waiting in an alley for Juniper to come out of her therapy session, and she looks like she's been crying. Zane wants to make her feel good, so he puts he pulls her in deeper to the alley and starts to finger her. He pulls her pants down far enough and lowers to his knees and starts to go down on her because he needs more. He then lifts her so her legs are resting on his shoulders, and he just continues. This, love it. Wish I could do this in real life. <laughs> But I, like, <laughs> would crush the person below me. <laughs> no, you wouldn't. But, like, I like the concept of this. I just don't it was know hot. how realistic I it would is. just be so afraid to, like, someone walk up. Well, yeah. I didn't mean in public, but that's a lot. <laughs> the things that they're doing just, like, in private. Right. She comes and says it's her turn now. And Zane replies that she can use her tongue in the car, but he's too eager to get her home. She laughs, which he also, like, mentions that he loves the sound of her laugh. And wants to, like, make it happen more. And, like, that's another thing he's going to start chasing. Are her, is her laughter. And they make their way. Zane has his own little wolf for eternity. I love The it. end. Oh, so good. So good. So that was Her Soul for Revenge by Harley LaRue, book two in the Souls trilogy. Yep, and Juniper did get her revenge. And Juniper, that bitch got her revenge and found love in a hopeless place. <laughs> so that was her soul for revenge. Love it. Speaking of loving it, let's get into the loves and hates of this book. I would love to. So I think this is going to be a blanket statement. I always put down just the most obvious things to start out with because I just like to readdress the basics. Juniper and Zane. I mean, Juniper being a badass and Zane feeding into that. I really loved their dynamic as individual characters and the mm -hmm. dynamic of them as a couple. And I really loved the great banter and the good sex scenes. I agree with every single point of that statement. And, you know, in this type of podcast, it's hard to, like, really describe the banter and mm -hmm. how things grow and progress without literally reading from the book. Yeah. But it's so well done. With these characters? If you haven't read it yet, what's wrong? Go read it. If you have, then you know what we're talking about. So I think just in general, I just, I really could get behind our main characters as individuals, as couples, and everything in between when it specifically comes to Juniper and Zane. And just, Juniper is just such a great main character. Loved her. I love that she wasn't meek and I love that she wasn't meek like Ray. She was very strong and just saved herself. Like, yes, Zane helped a lot, but Juniper also handled things on her own. Right. And I like the progression of Zane and Juniper from Raylan and Leon. Like, I like the progression of who we kind of get it as our leads as yeah. the series goes on. Like, I think that starting with Ray and Leon was a good... Smart choice. Yeah. And then I really like Juniper and Zane because they're just like batshit crazy, man. Yeah, I don't know if I would have been able to, like, finish with the series if I started with Zane and Juniper, just because it's a lot. It is. It's a lot. But in the best way. Mm -hmm. But I liked the progression, and I honestly think that Everly in book three is going to be a mix of the two. Like, I think that she's going to be kind of, like, a badass, but, like, Everly kind of comes off as, like, being timid. Mm -hmm. But I think it's going to be, like, she's going to start timid and then maybe come into herself as she and... Kel and progress on their journey because sometimes with a series you can get similar leads yeah. and it turn into okay I'm just rereading the, the same story the same book yeah but I did not feel like that no this was a completely different vibe and story even though like you do pick up on a lot of things that you've read you know that we read in the first book but those p things needed to be in there fill in one the plot holes from book one but it didn't feel super repetitive. No, no. And I thought that Harley did a really good job at the scenes that did have overlapping. She brought in new things. Yeah, and gave us a different perspective. And didn't really linger. Yeah. It was like, you know, the, the Halloween scene I really enjoyed because 
you do kind of see where Zane and Juniper are coming from and their side of things, but it's kind of in and out with Ray. It's kind, mm-hmm. it's exactly it's the pace that you would want. You're not harping too much on the things you do know that are going on. Exactly. And I like that a lot. So something I loved from the Hell on Earth party. Ooh, yeah. The bartenders. So you don't get to order your drink. The bartender makes what you need. And Zane, before he became a soul hunter, wanted to be a bartender. And so I really enjoyed that whole scene. And Hannah was the one who actually got Zane into soul hunting. Yeah, I liked that too. And I like because it's because Zane, you're in his point of view for some of this. And how he describes and like thinks about it is like it's oh, it's a skill yeah. that these bartenders learn. Mm-hmm. And it's something that interested him before he found his purpose as a soul hunter. And that learning and being able to read people. And like that's Which is probably that why Zane he can really read Juniper so well. Right. And I think that as being a soul hunter, you also have to read people. Specifically, if you're like Zane and only go after certain types of souls, you have to be able to read people to know that that is who you want to go after. Yeah, he picks the difficult ones. He doesn't pick something easy. I mean, he got an easy one with, you Meredith. know, with Meredith, but that was out of necessity. Right, that was a last resort. He didn't actually want it. He just needed it. Yeah. And then also, I really appreciated the whole bartender, like mixologist, like making fancy cocktails because I mean, the whole potions aspect of this podcast. Yeah, very relatable. Something that I thought that was better in this book than in the first book, which I can appreciate. I feel like the ending was better paced than for her soul to take. Mm -hmm. Plus, I like that we got a little spicy scene in the epilogue, which the epilogue felt a little bit better than for her soul to take. It was still really short, but at least it wasn't as short as book one. Right. And we actually had like dialogue between Juniper and Zayd where with Leon and Ray, it was literally just monologuing. Yeah. It wasn't any interactions between the the two characters themselves. And then we got a little bit of a time jump. So like we know they've been together for a little bit versus just like I don't really know. four days right. or something. Right. But I do feel like as for the ending part, I do think that the events and kind of how starting with really Kent – I would say when like Kent's death happened to Victoria's sacrifice through Jeremiah getting the power of the gods to the Reaper and everything like that, I thought was explained and paced a lot better than Ray and Leon. Agreed. Like with Ray and Leon, I kind of was just like, oh, we're in the thick of it and it's over. This I felt like it was a little bit more like thorough, maybe? It was. It definitely was. And and again, because it also filled those plot holes from... Book one. Book one that did move too fast. Mm -hmm. So it's like you got it made up for it here. Yeah. I really I I thoroughly enjoyed this. I will say my last love that I have written down was I do love Zane taking Meredith's soul and how that all goes down and then Juniper like killing her instantly. Mm -hmm. Because Meredith was kind of an understated character of the Hadley's family. Yeah. Obviously she was the least talked about, the least interacted with. But I'm glad that she still got a fate that was worthy of, like, everything that she's done. Oh, definitely. And I kind of hope we get a little bit more insight with her in book three. We probably will because, like, she... I mean, Everly grew up and lived with the evil stepmother. Right. Yeah. I think that with Everly's book, we are going to get the full... Hadley story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because as much as I hate the Hadleys, I'm interested in their dynamics and like you know it's how be they were shitty, able though. to like get away with all of this stuff and get like the whole town under there. Right. But you know it's going to be shitty because they're going to be like mean to Everly. Like yeah. it's going to be a lot of like. It's going to be a lot of trauma dumping. Yeah. Any other specifics, loves that you have? I mean, we kind of covered this. I loved Hannah and Sadie. Yes, I do too. I would be interested in like, I would like a novella. Or a book of their story. Yeah. Because I liked their dynamic a lot in the very brief two chapters that they're involved in. Yeah, I want that as a novella. And then I kind of do want a novella with, like, the Hell Council. Oh, that would be cool. Because, like, if Zane has to, like, stand trial or whatever for the actions that happened, I would kind of like a novella of that. That would kind of be cool. I would read that. Because then we can, like know the inner workings of hell and I just think it'd be interesting yeah I kind of want a book that takes place after the three girls die and they're all in hell 
that would be another good one. You know, like, I think that would be really cool. And like, do they meet up? Do they become friends? Do they become hell BFFs? Right. Because I mean, Leon and Zayn are besties. So you mm-hmm. would think that like Juniper and Ray would run into each other in the afterlife. Callum, I'm not sure where he falls in because we still don't really know a whole lot about him. No. So we don't, he might, him and Everly might be a step of their own. You know, but maybe, but you know, who knows with book three, maybe they all kind of become a little three musketeers. Yeah. Sort of and thing. you know, in like that, if, if Harley decided to do a novella, like I wouldn't mind that novella being just all smut with very little plot because I don't need, oh, a, like they're dead. They're in their happily ever after, you know, eternal life, whatever. I just want to kind of see the dynamic of what, like, how's like, what they're doing, like, what sex stuff are they getting up yeah, to. like a 200-page novella about that. Yeah, I don't need, I don't need something like this where they're trying to save the world. Yeah. Just give me some good sex scenes, give me some good dynamics between them in the afterlife, and I'll be very content. That'd just be some, great. Just some thoughts for you, Harley. <laughs> Let us know if you need us to elaborate. <laughs> I know. Can this be like a collab little, can this be a collab novella thing? (laughs) Want to move into some hates? Yes. My first hate. Very obvious. Jeremiah and the God and his servants. Just like book number one, they get worse in book number two. I hate Jeremiah more in book two than I did in book one. I hate the God and its servants more. I'm kind of glad that like he became the bigger villain though. That was a, a good twist. It was. It was. I still just hate him, though. Oh, definitely. But I am kind of glad that Harley, besides for the beginning part, Juniper really didn't have to deal with the Eld Beasts once Zane took her under his wing. Yeah. And I liked that because I do feel like that would have been very repetitive. That would have. And they were also after Ray at that point, too. Right. But there's so many Eld Beasts. You would think that they would be able to... Split up. split up and conquer. But I do think that they might have stayed away from Juniper more because Zane is a power, more powerful demon yes, than Leon. That, that is something that did get mentioned briefly. Like the Eld Beasts were going to stay away from his house because like they're aware of who he is. Right. And and just like the hierarchy, mm-hmm. Zane is more powerful than Leon. So I think that that's kind of the way that Harley got out of having to involve the Eld Beast in Juniper's. But Juniper had a lot of other shit going on. Which and it would have been overkill. It would have been overkill. It would have. And that kind of leads to a hate that I have. The fucking Watcher. That was my second hate of my two. I did not appreciate this new monster in the slightest. No, like, I'm kind of glad we got a new edition of a monster. I'm kind of scared. Are we going to get a new monster in book three? Jesus. Well, you know that they're going to be taking on the actual God. So who knows what he's going to have at his freaking, like the sources that he's going to be able to draw from. And this is kind of like a love hate. How this book went more horror a little bit, like yeah. gory horror. Yes. Yes. I mean, it was well done. But there was just so many points. I was just grossed out. But I feel like it was kind of on brand. Yeah, it was needed. It was. And Juniper and Zane are both brutal. Like, they, when they kill someone, like, they're going to fuck shit up. Yeah. But even just, like, you know, with the god taking over Jeremiah. And just Right. Uh, but think about it. Like, her soul to take and her soul for revenge. Mm-hmm. Like, obviously, revenge sounds a lot more intense than just taking a soul. Yeah. So I think that it kind of sets us up. But overall, I mean, I didn't have a whole lot of hates with this book. No, me either. Like, those are my really only two. And they were very obvious hates as to, like, they're just shitty characters and shitty monsters that I don't want to be around. Yeah, but as far as, like, pacing, wasn't mad at. wasn't The writing's great. Writing was great. Wasn't mad at the pacing of the relationship either because, you know, they do have, like, a back story and a back connection. They do fall in love pretty quickly. But, I mean, it's not instant. Like, no. Juniper fights it for a while, and she fights Zane for a while. I'm not mad at the pacing either. No. And especially this is a monster romance. Who cares about the pacing of the love? You know, like... You're not wrong. <laughs> but yeah, I didn't really have much else to really hate on. No. So what was your favorite smut scene? I know we kind of mentioned briefly in our mm. breakdown. So my favorite full-on sex scene is definitely Dom Juniper. Yeah, same. Same. I really enjoyed that sex scene. And Harley writes a pretty good in-depth sex scene. Like, these sex scenes are decently long. Yeah, they... And they incorporate a lot of things. And they typically go between both point of views. Like, you get part of it in Juniper's perspective, part of it 
in Zane. And I'm pretty sure she did that with Leon and Ray too, mm-hmm. which I really like. I like getting. And there was a lot more in this one. Yeah. And then my favorite kind of more tensiony moment was at Club Hell. Oh, for sure. The dance floor. Same. Yeah. What's not to love? And I do think this one is a little bit more realistic than Raylan's nipple piercings, right? Like, I know, because that was something that kind of irked you where you're like, oh, that irks I the just crap couldn't, out of me. like, I can't wrap my head around it. This, this one was, was very different it, and more realistic. Yeah. Mm, not so much because she was still like in the middle of being pleasured and like you can fuck up the nerve endings in your tongue right with getting that pierced but he wasn't physically doing anything to her when he was piercing her he stops because he's the one piercing her and she's just kneeling there she just was on the verge of like he gets her to the point where she's about to come stops has her sit up and kneel as he then pierces the tongue so it's not like with Raylan where she was on the dildo and she was like, like actively actively had a vibrator. Like it was a lot with the Ray. Mm-hmm. This was very much like it was two separate going down on her, stopping, piercing, going down on her. But I could still see her being like very like panty and just making that difficult to them. Well, pierce. yeah. But once again, but, uh, made up. Fiction. We'll, uh, we'll, you know. Irritates me a little bit, but whatever. Not but enough, that was still Not as much as the nipple yeah. piercing. Yeah. It was a great scene though. It was. It was a great tension scene. Want to move into our casting calls? Yeah, let's cast this. Woo woo. Okay, so this week we're casting, obviously, Juniper Zane, and we're doing Victoria and Jeremiah. Yeah, casting some more of the Hadleys. We're casting more of the Hadleys and obviously our two main love interests. So, Alex, tell me, who did you cast for your Juniper? So, my Juniper, I casted Ella Balinska from the new Charlie's Angels movie. Which angel did she play? She played um, the British one, like the badass one that was like really, really good oh, with. Oh, yes. I mean, they're all yes, good with yes, weapons, yes, 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 but yes. she was like extra good with weapons and fighting. And I like that. I like that a lot. And she's tall and freaking gorgeous. I chose Phoebe Tonkin. First of all, Phoebe plays Juniper like characters mm-hmm. already. Yeah. So, like, she has that attitude down. She's also tall because Juniper is dis- depicted as being like 5'8", five, 5'9". Five, you know, Phoebe Tonkin is also on the taller side. And I just think that Phoebe, I was really picturing like her as Juniper. Just the dark hair, the, you know, she's obviously beautiful. Yes. Obviously. Oh, that's a fantastic choice. Yeah. Plus, like, I don't know, like the character that she played in The Vampire Diaries, Haley. Mm-hmm. Kind of gives me vibes of Juniper. Oh, for sure. So I'm already like, she can do it. So moving on to our Zane. I had a trouble. I had a hard, you know I had a hard time because you helped me with this Zane. I did. Because I was just on the struggle bus. I, I get too into this. So, <laughs> and I drive myself crazy. We went on a very funny journey to get to your Bro, choice. we were looking at everyone and anyone. <laughs> But before we get to my, who did you choose? I'm very curious. So I picked the actor Aiden Turner. He's most known right now for the TV show Poldark. Oh, okay. It's like a BBC okay. show. Dark hair. Dark yeah. hair. He has like a very angular face that kind of looks a little demony. Yes. I agree. He kind of does have, yeah, you're right about the angular face. Just like very yeah. pointy. But like, like in great ways? Yes. I don't know. No, I'm here for that. I ended up going after choosing like eight different people. I finally landed on Adam Levine. So Maroon 5 front man. And I think I told you I was like, I would choose Adam Levine if he was like five, six inches taller and like buffer. Because don't get me wrong. He's very lean and mm-hmm. he's very defined. But like I'm picturing Zane a little bit bigger, like a little bit buffer, more yeah. like a bodybuilder. Type five, maybe not that extreme. But like the tattoo element of Adam Levine is exactly kind of what I'm picturing because Zane is extremely tatted as well. Yep. And just like, you know, the dark. Plus, Adam Levine is like kind of charming looking. Like he has the bad boy air, but also has the charm. Zane being a demon, like a soul hunter, you have to be very good looking and have charm. So that's who I went with. It's a good choice. Thank you. You helped me. 
I did. We you went through a very fun. For me. <laughs> went through a very funny journey. Oh geez, let's not relive that. That was giving me stress, man. <laughs> we went from like wrestlers. Who did I have originally? Originally, it was um, it was a very specific movie for this person. Justin Thoreau from Thoreau. Charlie's Angels Full Throttle. Yes. Specifically, Specifically that. that. Yes. And then it went to wrestlers. Well, no, it, it was Justin Thoreau that then got us to Adam Levine. Okay. Yes. It was a journey. It was. <laughs> it was a journey. It was really funny, though. It was. So, Victoria. Victoria Hadley, who do you have? For Victoria, I have Adelaide Kane Love from that Rain. choice. Really like that choice. She's freaking pretty, too. Mm-hmm. She's so pretty. But yeah, I but it has kind of like that bitchy air yes. that I feel like Victoria would have. Yes. I went Kea Scodolario. Scodolario? Kea Scodolario. Okay. I think that's how you pronounce her name. She was from the original Skins UK version. She also was in Maze Runner. She plays Dylan O'Brien's, the main character's love interest. That oh, girl. Okay. okay. So. Yes. And she kind of gives me that like bitchy air too to her Mm -hmm. that she could tap into kind of being like stuck up and not saying that she is but I could see but she could act it yes and last but not least the main villain of the book Jeremiah freaking Jeremiah Hadley who did you cast as this bastard so I picked Dutch soccer player Frankie De Jong ooh okay and why is that like what made you choose him well I wanted to lean into the soccer player thing that Jeremiah is oh yeah Jeremiah is like a Captain. Yeah. Okay. And then, I don't know, sports guys just give me, like, douchey bad guy vibes. Okay. I hate to generalize that, but, you know. That's okay. But also, like, just he kind of gives me, like, frat bro, sports jock thing, come, you know, could play coming from a rich family. I don't know. He just, he fit for me. Okay. I could see that. I like that. So I went with a UK actor for Jeremiah. I went with Callum Turner who he was in the Magical Beasts and Where to Find Them. Mm -hmm. Um, He plays Newt Scamander's brother. Yes. Yeah. And I don't know. He kind of gave me – there was this one picture I found on um, Google where he was in, like, a soccer getup, and I was like, oh, my gosh, that's perfect. Like, he plays soccer as well. So I kind of went for the same type of thing. But I don't know about him. I hate to say it, but he has a very nice – punchable face like I could see him being a villain yeah and like he's good looking where you know he's gonna be able to like charm people but you kind of want to punch him but I kind of want to punch him and like no offense like Callum I'm sorry (laughs) I I wouldn't actually punch you (laughs) I kind of wanted to punch his character in Fantastic Beasts though oh did you a little bit it's been a really long time since I've seen that movie I have to rewatch them like I liked him but same thing it's like you're charming but I kind of want to punch you. But I kind of still want to punch you. And that's kind of like Jeremiah. I could see being charming because he is. He charms all of his freaking followers, but he's also very punchable. Yes. So. And then ultimately killable. <laughs> yes. My reasoning. <laughs> I'm here for it. <laughs> so those are our casting calls. You can find those again on our Instagram, Emotions and Potions Pod. Yep. We'll put pictures up so you know what we're, who we're talking about. And yeah. And kind, kind of, of who we're picturing as we're reading these books as... Yeah. An honorable mention I want to do from talking out the plot of this book. I kind of want Quentin Tarantino to be the director. I know. I think that he would do a really good job. I think he would make them a lot scarier. I'm here for that, though. Maybe not the first movie. This movie. See, I could see this book being a really good series where it's like one of those like limited time series because obviously there's going to be an end where we get like eight to ten episodes sort of thing and it's done yeah or even like two seasons of Mm -hmm. eight to ten because i would love to have this this series once it's finished like all happening at the same time on the tv show so it wouldn't be like season one it's ray and leon it would all be intermixed so it's like you're following these three plot points throughout the whole whole show and i just think that would be a really good like i would fuck with that that would be a cool way to do it. Like on HBO, you mm-hmm. could get away with a lot of shit. You could do a lot of these sex scenes on HBO. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I just like yelled because I'm very excited about this idea. And I wish I knew who to pitch it to. <laughs> <laughs> How can we make that be our job? I know. I just want so many jobs that are not the jobs that I have. <laughs> <laughs> so now we got to give the soundtrack. Yes. And you know what? We mentioned it last week that we loved our Her Soul to Take playlist. 
I love this playlist too. Same. I thought this playlist was banging. Very different. Very because different. Because the themes are different. Mm-hmm. Still but darker. Had, yeah. But I mean, definitely we're going on the revenge But like I had track. a hard time choosing my songs. Like I wanted to choose a lot more than my five. I know. I had a hard time narrowing it down because there are just so many good there were ones. Some, there are really good ones. So how many how many do you have this week, Alex? I did five as well. One, two, three, four, five. Perfect. I wanted to count and make sure that I actually wasn't lying. And I did. Okay. Do you want to start, darling? Sure. So overall vibes song. Last Laugh by Fletcher. I have that one too. Uh, okay, yes. This happened last time. Yes. Last Laugh, Fletcher. Oh, it's such a great song. And overall vibes, I'm there with you. Another kind of, so I had kind of two Mm -hmm. that had an overall kind of vibe. So my first was Laugh, Laugh, Last Laugh by Fletcher. My second was Vengeance on My Mind by g Easy featuring Dana. Mm -hmm. And that one, one. oh, like, and just like the music of it, like the bass and stuff. I'm like, oh, this is just like, it's a little darker, you know, like. It hits. It hits. It hits. The next song choice is going to be a song for Juniper. Okay. Which is Little Pistol by Mother Mother. Nice. That's a good one. She is a little pistol. She is. And Mother Mother is kind of like a darker darker musical. Mm -hmm. So my Juniper song was Fighter by Christina Aguilera. Perfect. That bitch is a fighter, man. Yeah, she definitely is. I like how we also are kind of having the same sort of themes for I our know. songs. I know. Because we don't that. talk about these beforehand. No. We sometimes don't talk about our casting. Yeah. But we rarely actually talk about the songs. Mm-hmm. So. So my next song is Progress of Juniper and Zade's Relationship. Ooh, okay. What's that? Over It by Rivals. Okay. I like that. I like that a lot. So my next song is kind of also a Juniper song. Um, I just really liked Juniper. So I gave her two songs. And I, mean, I she's a fantastic female lead. Yeah. And the song that I chose was Easier Than Lying by Halsey. And more so because like in Halsey's song, she's most likely singing about like a romantic partner. But I interpreted it as like if it was in this setting, like the Hadleys. Yeah. How the Hadleys kind of like deceived her. And there's this great like the first line is like, um, I am what you make me and I'm becoming more and more a villain every day. Like you reap what you sow. If you hate the, if you hate the creation, like hate the creator, that type of thing. Yes. And like, I just really think that that sums up Juniper's struggles with the Hadleys. The Hadleys fucked her over. Oh, and I and, big time. And that song is like a little darker, harder and like how it escalates towards the end and it has all of the like, almost like headbanger, like it just fit this book really well, just the instrumentals too. Such a good choice. And I fucking love Halsey and I'm still on my Halsey high, so. (laughs) Can't blame you there. (laughs) My next song is a a Revenge Time song. Ooh, let's hear it. Raise Hell by Dorothy. And Dorothy's another one that's like the band, oh yeah. Yeah. Like matches the aesthetic of this book. And my last song kind of incorporates like Zayn and Juniper's love. And that's Hate Fuck by The Bravery. Good one. And then my final choice is the sexual chemistry kind of song, which is Body Talks by The Struts featuring Kesha. I like that song. I think we just are geniuses. You're not wrong. (laughs) You are not wrong at all. I am obsessed with these song choices that we have. And the full playlist is on our Spotify. Yep. Emotions and Potions pod. Just like the other socials. Yeah, and they, there's a lot of songs on that bad boy. I was listening to it today. Same. It's such a good playlist. It's very good. And it, when you're there, I mean, look at all the other playlists that we have for all the other episodes that we've already covered. They're just as good. They really are. I'm telling you, we're, mu- we're geniuses. I don't know what type of genius, but like, <laughs> we are, okay? Once you maybe get a little too obsessed over the things we read. it's That's definitely our water signs. Our double water size. Right. We, yeah, we dive too deep into these fictional worlds. And worlds. we just can't escape them. Yeah. Why would we, though? <laughs> <laughs> okay, enough of that. Back on track. Back on track. So let's just, let's rate everything. Yes. It's time to rate. All right. So my spice. I think my, I think I rated book one four out of five. And I upgraded to a 4.2 out of five for revenge. I'm giving this one a full five out of five. Really? 
What? So what made it for what you? What was it lacking? I mean, you're not wrong. We got a good amount of it. It was in-depth, a lot of different kinks, a lot of different positions, a lot of different types of sex. Okay, yeah. When you put it like that. I mean, I don't know how much more extreme their sex could have gone other than them actually killing each other. (laughs) That's true. That's true. I never thought of it that way. But you're right. I mean, there were a lot of sex scenes. They were very in-depth, a lot of kinks, a lot of tropes. I mean, you make good, valid arguments. But I think I'm going to stick with a 4.2. I, You know, you are entitled to that opinion <laughs> and assessment. I'm glad you're so accepting <laughs> and understanding. I mean, because there could always be something out there that is more. Right. I just, five I, out of five for Okay. Me. So what did you give the overall book? Nine out of ten. Same, same. I think I gave, you gave book one like a 7.5. Mm-hmm. I gave book one, I think, an 8.8, some bullshit like that, pulled out of my ass. This week, I went full nine. I thought that this was a very, very well done book. And as a reread, I was getting a little tired just because we've been putting out so many episodes that I was just tired of We the read prep. a lot, y'all. Yes. I was tired of the prep work, but I was not tired of the actual story. I was just tired. I was procrastinating on, like, writing my book report. <laughs> Fair yeah. enough. <laughs> I was starting to... Hit, to hit a slump, like a reading slump. And then it was just like, I don't want to hit a reading slump with this. So it's like, as soon as I started feeling drained, I would stop reading because it's like, I don't want this story to be ruined because right. it's so fantastic. It's great. I would recommend it. I would recommend the series mm-hmm. to anyone who likes a darker paranormal type of romance. I just think overall Harley has done a really, really good job. And I'm very excited for book three. I'm very excited for book three because I did give book one a hate letter. Right. And this story redeemed. Your hate. It redeems book one, which then made me appreciate book one more to have this, which is why like just book one on its own hate so far the whole thing together. Fantastic. So as a standalone, what would you rate? Would you give this a love or a hate letter? As a standalone, I would give this a love. Okay. Because there aren't really any plot holes. You're right. Because book one, there were a lot of things that were happening behind the scenes as we see in book two. And you get enough information about Ray to be satisfied with what you know about her and not necessarily need to have her story. Right. Because to this story, she's not integral, really. You you get just enough about her where you may want to learn more, read that book. But honestly, and because I do agree that so far of these two books, I do think that you could read them as standalones and you could read them out of order. Mm-hmm. Would I want to? Absolutely no. not. I think you need the first one to tr- appreciate. Well, I oh, also think. I um, maybe. I don't know. I also think that if I read Juniper's story first and then went to Ray's, I would be let down. Oh, Yeah. Definitely. Like, it's definitely a progression Mm -hmm. in storytelling. I don't get me wrong. I loved Ray and Leon's story. I gave it a love. I gave it a love letter and I still really, really like it. But Juniper and Zane's was just a lot more intense that I think if you read their story first and then went backwards, it would be a letdown. Yeah. You'd kind of be like, oh, it's like we're at level 10 here. And then to go to like an eight. I would say like a six. But, <laughs> <laughs> but like, and I, I just think that if I, based on what we've already been given of this series, book three is probably going to be the most wild mm-hmm. of the series. And as, as it should be, because so far, Harley is really pumping us up. Like we're yeah. going in an upward motion. I feel like book three is going to make or break this. I do too. And we will know in August. Hopefully. Hopefully. That's the intended release time. From what we were able to web sleuth. Oh my gosh. We had to like freaking dig. We were on Facebook. We were on Twitter. Twitter. Reddit. Goodreads. Just Google. We were on her personal website. We went everywhere. And I think we found like a random Facebook comment. Yeah. That said, my hopes are August. August. So we'll see if that happens. If it's a little delayed, whatever. But yeah, I do think book three is going to be the make or break. But I'm very excited for that story. So what was your, what's your final letter to this? Oh, for sure, love. I feel like I have, like, there's no way that I could give book one a love and this a hate. No way. I had two hates and they were characters. Not <laughs> right. even anything that, like, there has to be a villain. <laughs> there has to be bad <laughs> things. To. So, yeah. No, for sure. Straight up hard love. 
So far, it's a love, the whole series. I really like Harley. The whole series so far is a love. Just the standalone ratings for me were hate. I feel that. You know, now that we've filmed this episode, last week when we filmed Her Soul to Take and you were kind of talking about your hate letter, I kind of was like, I low-key can understand, but like I'm calling bullshit. Like I don't fully agree. But now I get it more. I like I get where you're coming from now having reread the second book and like having this discussion again. I'm kind of like now I get what she was saying about the standalone element. It was a hate. Was I a still enjoyed it. It's just I love this one. Yeah. The first one it's like I enjoyed, I really liked it. Love this. Yeah. But yeah, so it's it's a love across the board from us this week on emotions and potions. Yay. Her Soul for Revenge by Harley LaRue. It's on Kindle Unlimited, along with the first one. Great read. Recommend. This would be a wild ride as an audiobook. I wonder what the audio is like, though. I don't think there is one yet. Oh. Well, I haven't been able to find it. Oh, okay. Because I was kind of, when I was starting to hit slumping with mm -hmm. it, I was kind of like, maybe I could listen to it. Can not find anything? Oh, okay. Well, these are newer books, so. And I think that she's a newer author. So maybe they just haven't gone around to it. But okay. That pretty much wraps up another episode of Emotions and Potions, a love slash hate letter. And it was a love letter to her soul for revenge. Yes. So thank you, Harley. We are enjoying. Give me her soul of a witch. Please. Yes. We're enjoying the series. Just give us the last one. We're dying to know how this all freaking ends. But anyway, you made it through another episode. So congratulations. Drink that drink. Read that book. Drink the bloody dark and stormy. Come back next week. Subscribe, follow, All share the us. Say hi. <laughs> but until next time, I'm Ashton. I'm Alex. See ya. Bye.